Good evening. It is 5.30. We have a full dais, and I am calling this meeting to order. We are going to go through both the executive session, and we are also going to take care of two work session briefings before we start our normal standard meeting at 6.30. So at this time, we will be going into executive session for item 2A. City Council shall convene into closed executive session pursuant to Texas Government Codes 551.071 and 551.072 to seek the advice of legal counsel and to deliberate upon the acquisition of real property interests associated with the construction of wastewater treatment plant number three at 385 State Highway 304, Unit B, Bastrop, Texas 78602 and its collection systems, including all related agreements, authorizations, easements, resolutions, and associated legal actions. It is 531 and we are in executive session. All right, we are out of executive session and back into regular session at 543. Council, we're on the top of page two, item number three, take any necessary or appropriate action on matters posted for consideration in the closed executive session. There will be no additional actions. And so we are moving on to item 4A, and that is the work session briefing received presentation on the new FEMA flood insurance study. Flood insurance rate maps, impacts on the community, and floodplain administration. And this will be presented by Allison Land, our senior planner. Ms. Land. Good evening. All right, so I'm going to give you an overview of the new uh, preliminary FEMA flood maps and what that means for floodplain administration in the city of Bastrop. Um, I'll give you a brief overview. I'll give you a brief overview of why we do floodplain administration. Um, breeze through some basic floodplain terminology just to make sure we're all on the same page. Show you some of the major impact areas and changes to the uh, flood insurance rate maps. Um, talk briefly about community currently adopted standards, show you some resources where, where you can find all of this information at another time, um, and talk about some of the future items that we will be bringing before you. All right, so floodplain administration. The goals of floodplain administration, uh, the primary thing is to make sure that we ensure the health, safety, and economy of the community. Uh, we want to make sure that people are safe, animals, which includes pets, which includes livestock. Um, all of those items are protected, not endangered, um, and accounted for. That also includes not just the people on any given piece of property, but our community responders. Any of our emergency personnel going to assist those properties um, in the event of flooding. Um, lower the amount of damaged property. Um, I'm sure, you know, Bastrop has had a lot of declared disasters. We all know that damaged property, it's, it's not only a burden to the homeowner, but to the community as well. Um, and reduce economic losses. You know, when we have damage to commercial properties, that's time that they are closed, that they are not generating revenue, that they're not bringing in sales tax for the community. So the city's role is to adopt and implement ordinances that meet or exceed the National Flood Insurance Program. And I will talk a little bit more about that in a minute, um, but that is one of our, our bare minimum goals that we would like to meet. Uh, 
review all development in floodplain areas and issue permits accordingly. Any of our floodplain prone areas, we want to make sure that any new development there meets standards. It's safe for people, animals, and our emergency responders. Uh, we coordinate with local, state, and federal officials. Water does not know administrative boundaries, right? Doesn't matter if we're in the city limits, the county, um, the state. So we coordinate with all the, the local entities um, around us as well as up the chain all the way to the federal level. Uh, we want to balance economic gain of development against the resulting increase in flood hazards. Does that development and the inherent dangers that um, are present meet the economic goals of the community? Right? Do we uh, really need that commercial business? Do we really need more flood um, area or homes in flood areas? Um, and what are the risks? It's just a balancing act. Um, the city also has an obligation to communicate that risk to its citizens, right? And we do that through the website, um, social media, various meetings, whether that's, you know, this meeting, any board and commission meeting, community meetings, all of that, um, and permit resources. You know, sometimes a person's first interaction is getting a permit. And at that point, they're going, that may be the first time that they ever learned they're in a floodplain. All right, we regulate and guide development to minimize the risk, adopt standards, issue permits, um, you know, and that's done with ordinances, with, um, through permit regulation, hey, we're going to require a permit, and hey, this is what you need to show us so that we can ensure that we are meeting these standards. Um, plan for evacuation, public service impacts. You know, we put together plans like the hazard mitigation plan and work with the county and surrounding entities to do that, right? Um, you know, and we also have at an operational level all the flood readiness levels. At what point are we cleaning out the, dish the ditches? At what point are we barricading roads? You know, all of these things at multiple levels to help mitigate risk and protect our citizens. And then we also identify mitigation opportunities such as studies and plans. So studying Gill's Branch, what makes an impact? What pulls properties out of the flood zone? Um, you know, do we have a comprehensive drainage strategy? You know, where can we target our resources and our assets to really make an impact? Why do we do this? Big picture, Texas floods. It's always in the top three. It's Texas, Louisiana, and Florida. Just depends on where the hurricanes hit in any given year. Um, but it's always in the top three. Bastrop is subject to riverine and shallow flooding. Um, you know, we all know that there's localized drainage challenges. That's why council adopted the stormwater drainage manual and improved drainage standards. Um, you know, we've had 10 locally and nine federally disa declared disasters in the last 10 years. Four of those are floods, and one was Hurricane Harvey. Um, so given that half of those are flooding, it's a pretty big deal in Bastrop. We want to make sure that we are protecting our community against those hazards. Um, NFIP, like I said, that is the National Flood Insurance Program. This is what allows any property owner to obtain flood insurance. If we don't participate in that program, nobody gets flood insurance. All right. And then we have updated maps and areas of impact. All right, so the National Flood Insurance Program, uh, it is mandatory for communities to participate this, to participate if we want to receive federal disaster assistance. Um, if we don't have minimally adopted standards and administer those standards, FEMA is not going to provide money because are you really protecting homeowners, property owners, and those federal resources? Um, so they require participation before they give you funding. Um, we do have those minimum regulatory standards adopted, uh, and we actually have a couple of the, some of the minimum higher than minimum standards adopted as well. Um, another best practice is to participate in the community rating system. And I'll give you a brief overview of that in just a minute as well. Um, and then no adverse impact. So when you're talking you know, nationwide about no adverse impact, 
um, basically you're saying that any property owner cannot adversely impact their neighboring property. Uh, you cannot dump your water onto your neighbor's property or redirect flows and adversely impact them. Uh, the Texas Water Code actually makes a state law in Texas that you cannot do that. Not all states have that adopted. Texas does, which helps us out. All right, so the community rating system actually credits communities um, for having higher standards adopted. Um, and what this does is gives um, insurance premium discounts based on, uh, they call it classes, so they have different rate classes. So the more uh, stringent standards you have, the higher your rate classification and the more of a discount your community is eligible for. So some basics, um, the flood insurance study. So we have a preliminary flood insurance study that is, was released this spring as well as preliminary flood insurance rate maps. So your flood insurance study identifies uh, principal flood problems, source information for this latest one included LIDAR data, half study that we partnered with the county on, um, and some other data. It describes methodology and it also gives profiles of all these streams and rivers in town. Um, well, maybe not all of them, but uh, the major ones, and provides base flood elevations. Ms. Land, you might explain what LIDAR data is, because not everyone's familiar with that. Yes, ma'am. So LIDAR data um, is flown by either drone or airplane, and it shoots thousands and thousands of little points at the ground. And that allows an image to form similar to sonar, if you're familiar with sonar data. Um, and it gives you a picture based on all of those points that shows what your elevation is, where structures are, where vegetation is, where the ground is. Um, and it gives you a really good uh, picture of what the ground looks like. People have seen the planes and they'll yes. see them on that path. Mm -hmm. making several passes in this, and, and they've asked, so that's why I was mm -hmm. wanting you to explain that. Thank you very Excellent. much. Yes, ma'am. All right. All right, so identified problem areas for Bastrop. Uh, the Colorado River, it's a large watershed, part of the Highland Lake system. Um, you know, it has a very large watershed that water flows into, um, and then, you know, the Highland Lake system upstream from us series of dam networks, depending on what those dam operations do, can raise water levels here. Um, Gills Branch and Piney Creek, those are two of the main tributaries within the city of Bastrop going into the Colorado River. Uh, and there are no flood gauges here, so it's harder to gauge to figure out what the frequency of flooding is and exactly where it is. Um, but we have experienced localized flooding there and those, er those creeks have been studied um, more thoroughly than in the past. All right, flood insurance rate maps. So these are the actual maps that more people are familiar with. Um, you know, it's the map that has the blue area and the orange area and, and what's what, where's my property, here's my street, okay, great. Um, these are used for flood insurance and regulatory compliance. You know, that helps cities figure out, okay, you're in this zone, so that means that your standards are a, B, and C, right? Um, it also helps flood insurance carriers determine what is your risk and what is your corresponding rate. Uh, we've had updates in 1991 and 2006, and then the preliminary one was released this spring. So before we talk about areas of change, I wanna make sure everybody knows what these terms are. Um, A zones, these are previously what was known as the 100-year floodplain. FEMA has gotten rid of that terminology um, <laughs> because it's confusing. Because somewhat, we have a flood and someone thinks it's yes. gonna be 99 years before they flood again. That's right. essential, that's right. what the, And that is, right? that is a huge, mis huge. huge misconception. So it is a 1% annual chance. So that means there's a 1% chance in any given, any given year that the property may flood. So over the course of a 30-year mortgage, that relates to about 25%, which becomes a whole lot more real to people. 
<laughs> it's like all of a sudden, oh wait, I have this money invested. <laughs> okay, <laughs> makes you pay attention. Um, X zones that are shaded, those are the 0.2 annual chance. Previously that was known as the 500 year. Um, and then an X zone unshaded is a minimal annual chance. So just to be clear, there is no property anywhere in the United States that is not in a flood zone. Okay, just a matter of what's your chance. That right. being said, it may be a Noah's flood sort of situation <laughs> yes. to get you, but you're yes. saying there is an elevation that's above all other elevations that would ha cause your property to be inundated. Right. Okay. Yes. All right. So when you are, this is a sample of um, the firm that covers uh, 71 where it crosses a river in downtown. Um, just so that everyone is, gets familiar with what it looks like. You know, that blue zone, that's your one annual chance, um, previously known as a 100 year floodplain. That's where we have some increased regulations. The orange, that's your 0.2 annual percent chance. Um, you know, some pretty, pretty minimal regulations there. And the red hatched lines, that is the floodway. That is where water is expected to be in a flood event. You do not want development there. It will get damaged most likely um, and tend to lead to recurrent damages and claims. Base flood, um, that is the flood at having a 1% chance of being equaled or exceeded in any given year. Basically, where do we expect those flood waters to be? The base flood elevation. So this is important when you're going through the permitting process. You know, we will bring up base flood elevation and where are you in relation to that. That is so that we can figure out where is that base flood expected to be, right? Which zone are you in and at what elevation is it? And where are you putting your structure in relation to it? Are you going to be elevated above it? Are you going to be in it but flood proofed, you know, and, and you have different options. And the regulatory floodway, this is the water channel um, that discharges flood water, basically where you expect water to be in a flood. All right, there's handy dandy picture. Um, normal stream channel on a, on a wonderful day. Um, and then your base flood elevation is above that. That's your 1% annual floodplain. Um, really just graphic of what we just talked about. All right, LOMERS, that is a letter of map revision. Uh, these change the zone or the floodplain or floodway designation. Um, you know, a lot of times, especially in this area, you see these with, come in with a subdivision and somebody is filling land, right? They're bringing in dirt, making it taller or redirecting the water so that it's channelized over here and gives you a buildable area over there and um, that, physically changes your boundaries, okay? A LOMA, which is a letter of map amendment, establishes a property location in relation to your flood hazard area. So this doesn't change the boundaries on any maps, but what it might do is change your insurance rate. You might be able to say, hey, you know what? I got an elevation certificate from a surveyor that says my home is at this elevation and we know the base flood elevation in this area is whatever and you could qualify for a different rate. Elevation certificates are very important. You will need one of these when you're going through the floodplain permitting process. Um, it is obtained by a surveyor after placement of the home or after construction, and it shows where the finished floor is in relation to the ground. And that way we can ensure that everything was installed as your permit said it would, um, and that it does in fact meet all of the regulatory requirements. Um, that can also help support any LOMAs or LOMERS that you have in process, and it can also help determine your flood insurance rate. So, areas of change. This is Gill's Branch. Um, the areas in purple, are reduction in flood hazard zone. The areas in yellow are an increase in flood hazard zone. And then your blue and your orange are just, you know, what was and what is. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot of yellow on that map. 
Um, you know, there's a little bit of purple where the special flood hazard area has decreased. Um, but as Gills Branch, especially on the up creek side of the railroad, um, you know, it's been further studied, it's been studied more detailed, um, and we have better information. And turns out a lot of that information puts it in the flood hazard zone and that 1% annual chance. Piney Creek has also changed. Um, this has some pretty significant impacts on the north side of town. Um, you know, we have the, the solid yellow is your 1% annual chance area. Uh, the darker yellow with the, with the black cross hatch through it, that's an increase in the 0.2% annual chance. Um, and so that, that's impacting some property owners there. Um, it also even goes across 95, where, where a lot of people think they're uphill, um, but that is still a major watershed and creek, and there are still floodways up there. So we do have minimal adopted standards, you know, to participate in the National Flood Insurance Program. We do that, great. Uh, we also exceed by elevating, requiring an elevation two feet above the base flood elevation in the 1% annual chance special flood hazard area. Um, the stormwater drainage manual, uh, which applies to plats or large projects, um, you know, with the, meeting the standards there, uh, do not let you development, develop in the 101% annual flood chance area without doing a letter of map revision. So that slows down your development process to get through FEMA's regulatory process as well. Um, but it ensures that all of your stormwater is accounted for. It ensures that that development will not be impacting development across the river, down the river, up the river. Um, and it gives it a more comprehensive look. Ms. Land, it, um, it might be helpful for the public to understand that since FEMA generated maps, mm -hmm. FEMA is who generates the letter of map revision. So yes. let's talk, because that's not something that we have total control over. Yes, ma'am. Yes, so FEMA is the one who puts out these maps, who puts out this data, and it is, uh, it is a federal map. It is not the city of Bastrop saying, hey, this is where that boundary is. We have no control over that. Um, and so when you're doing a letter of map revision or map amendment, you have to go through FEMA's process because it's their map that you're changing. And then they notify the city they notify that the city. they've approved it and because those letters come to me is one of the reasons mm -hmm. that I know. And then, and when we receive it, then everybody's on the same page mm -hmm. in that and we officially change right. the FEMA map that we have here at the city of Bastrop because to your point of water not knowing boundaries, then mm -hmm. FEMA has federally changed that map now. It's like an official amendment to what they had previously issued. Correct. But sometimes they get backed up and sometimes mm -hmm. it takes a little while and sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes it takes a long while. We can help people make the submission, but we're just waiting on the letters to come back with approved or not. Right. Yes. All right, so impacts to property owners. Um, if you were not previously in a flood hazard zone that required insurance, you may re be required to have insurance now. Um, and if you went from a minimal hazard area to a 0.2% area, you may want to consider it. It just kind of depends on what you feel your risk is and, and what you know your local conditions to be. Okay, when you say it, you may be required, who might require a property owner to suddenly have flood insurance that didn't previously have flood insurance? Usually if you have a mortgage and you are um, subject to a lending institution. So what are the, the reason you're interested in that is if you have a mortgage, your house floods, mm -hmm. you may find that they say, we're giving you nothing because you were, in, you were notified of the new flood area and you didn't get flood insurance. That's yes. why everyone needs to be extremely interested. Am I yes. understanding that correctly? Yes, so you have, um, a certain amount of time to get into compliance with the new maps 
And if you don't, your lender may no longer cover any damages. So if your house gets taken out or is you know, substantially damaged, you may not be able to rebuild. And you may not receive money for your damaged home, which is not a spot anyone wants to be in. Um, floodplain development permits are required if you are in the 1% annual chance. So and that will be in addition to whatever your normal series of permits is. You always want to start with your floodplain permit. That's going to determine where you are, where you can be, and what elevation you are at, which may affect your porch, where you place things. Um, it may affect your building plans. So before you start that process, start with floodplain, figure out what your requirements are. Um, substantial improvement. This is one that catches people off guard. So if you choose to improve your structure more than 50% of its value, you are required to come into compliance. So people are more familiar with substantial damage where you know, if your structure is damaged more than 50% of its appraised value, uh, then you have to come into compliance. This also applies to anybody just regularly improving their home. So if you're planning on a substantial improvement, significant remodel, uh, you may be required to come into compliance, or you will be required to come into compliance. Um, and any subdivision plotting under our current regulations uh, does require a LOMER through FEMA. All right, we do have resources on the city website about this. Uh, we created a City of Bastrop floodplain management website. Uh, it's on the Planning and Development Department's um, page. We provided some quick links to the FEMA National Hazard Layer um, and the Flood Map Changes Viewer. Uh, so the National Flood Hazard Layer, that is an interactive map that lets you figure out where is your property, what zone am I in, and that shows the currently effective 2006 maps. Uh, the Changes Viewer shows the preliminary data that has been issued. Um, and it shows the areas of change. That's where those purple and yellow areas came from that I showed you earlier. Uh, we also link you know, the flood damage prevention order in chapter three of Muni Code, um, give you some resources, link the hazard mitigation plan, uh, link FEMA Flood Smart, that's the official site of the NFIP, um, and provide a guide to community map revisions in case you're interested in that. So in the future, we will be uh, looking to hold some public meetings with surveyors and engineers, with citizens, and with realtors. Um, all, each of those audiences has different interests and different focus areas. We want to make sure everybody understands how it impacts them. Um, we are still waiting. So updating the maps is both a federal and local process. So right now, it is going through the federal notifications. Um, when they are done with that, they'll let us know. We don't know when it's going to be. Um, not exactly. We expect it to be late summer, early fall, um, which will then start the appeals process to the data, um, which we will facilitate. So as soon as we have information on that, we will put it out, uh, let people know how they can go through that process, um, and we'll go through that process. And then once we get through that timeline, we will look at officially adopting the preliminary FIS and firms by ordinance. All right, we can also evaluate our community rating system eligibility. Um, that includes going through an NFIP review with um, our, um, I wanna say community resource officer, but that's not it. Um, but we have a, a state contact that we go through that with um, through our local FEMA office and verify insurance requirements for city buildings, make sure that any of them that are in floodplains have appropriate coverage, um, track our number of buildings, do some documentation, uh, and then coordinate with our CRS specialist on next steps, and then we can request a classification. And so then they will go through all of our regulations, all of our rules, all of our documentation, and figure out at what class um, we qualify for and what insurance premium discount our citizens will receive. 
Any questions? Mayor Pro Tem Nelson? Just real quick, so it, it'll be at least fall for we'll understand where CRS rating is? Yes. And probably after that, right? Uh, a little too early to. Could be, yeah. Could I mean, be. It, it would involve some, some deep dives into both, into all of our codes and standards, um, as well as just going through all of the, the paperwork and other documentation that feeds into it. So the feds hand that down to the state and then the state translates or interprets that information to the various counties and cities? It goes from the FEMA regional office, then there's a state coordinator, and we can coordinate with the state coordinator and they facilitate that communication back to the FEMA regional office. And we'll be communicating that process to, to, to our citizens through any kind of public forum we can. Yes, sir. Thank you. Really good job, Ms. Land. Council, any questions for Allison? One thing that I would like to city manager request is um, because there's some this, the words going to travel. What I need flood insurance. So it would be very nice to have a social media post with the hot link of this is what you click on to get to the map. Because, you know, right now you have to go like under residence, mm -hmm. under the, so if we could just help folks get straight to the map where they can put in their address, I think that would be a helpful way. And then, um, depending on what they find out when they put in their address, if they have questions, they can certainly call the city and they may be um, real interested in when those meetings are if, you know, if their property is impacted. So if, if you could take care of that, I would really appreciate it. Good job, Ms. Lamb. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you very much. Lot, lots to do. We all learned new acronyms. There'll be a test at the end of the meeting. <laughs> all right, Council, we are moving on to item 4B. It is 6.13. We were trying to get these things done before we start. We will start our regular meeting at 6.30. I am confident we're going to be able to get 4B done. We're on to item 4B. Receive presentation on the option to lease police vehicles, and we have Assistant Chief Stefanik with us here. Chief, take it away. Good evening, Mayor, City Council members, City Manager. So this evening I would like to present to you the option for the police fleet. Our current fleet is an aging fleet in which we have 23 uh, predominantly vehicles within the police department. Of the 23, 13 are assigned to the patrol division, four are assigned to the criminal investigations division, and two are up for auction. This graph illustrates the uh, yearly breakdown since fiscal year 2017 for maintenance for patrol vehicles. You can see that in 2020, we spent just under $63,000 on patrol maintenance. In fiscal year 2021, so far, we've spent just under $31,500 in vehicle maintenance. The types of maintenance are general maintenance, such as oil changes, and a variety of repairs that include radiator replacements and the replacements of camshafts. As of October 1st, 2020, our patrol vehicles have been in the shop over 100 times. 49 of these visits are considered general maintenance. 66 of these visits were considered unforeseen maintenance. These unforeseen issues have occurred while being driven on patrol, sometimes resulting in the units being towed. Recently, we had a vehicle breakdown during a pursuit. The volume of vehicle repairs has and is affecting the current manpower within our department. Unforeseen maintenance scheduling, the requirement of dropping off and picking up vehicles, the uncertainty of downtime without vehicles waiting to be fixed or waiting on parts has placed a strain on our department personnel. The age of our patrol vehicles is a large factor that contributes to these repairs. And as with all vehicles, wear and tear. Primarily, there is a significant amount of overuse due to compensating for vehicles that are in the shop. The current seven to nine patrol vehicles are being split between 14 officers on four different shifts, and in some cases being operated more than the normal 12 hours today and up to 24 hours a day. These same patrol vehicles are being used for special events and for security when not in use on patrol. This slide illustrates the fiscal year 2022 vehicles we are proposing to replace with lease cars rather than to purchase. You will see that the age of the vehicles ranges from five to 13 years in age. 
Engine hours are detrimental to our units, more so than vehicle mileage, primarily due to the demanding operational environment in which our police vehicles function. This next portion, Tracy Waldron will cover. It's more of the finance stuff. <laughs> All right, she's tapping Officer it onto the Stephanie CFO. Officer didn't want to talk about money. <laughs> well, I wanted to talk more about the vehicle equipment and replacement fund and kind of explain how these vehicles um, are participating in that fund. So we have 12 of the vehicles that um, Officer Stefanik is referring to in the VERF, but we have 11, I think that's actually, I guess that is actually 11, that are not, which means that in order to, to, to get them participating in the VERF, we have to purchase them first, and then the lease payments will start. And so to get those 11 vehicles in the VERF fund, it's going to be an outlay, and I've, I've approximated $610,000. Um, so we have looked at um, the lease program versus continuing the path that we're taking uh, with replacing vehicles and then starting them in the lease payments to our own replacement fund. And the lease payments are, they work out to be about the same as our future verse lease payments. The big difference is that we would be replacing the vehicles more often, so the maintenance would be a lot less and also the capital outlay that would be required to actually take these 11 vehicles, purchase them, and get them paying their, their own lease payments. So that, that's kind of the financial piece of it. If, if you have any questions about that, she's gonna take back over. So currently the, the schedule for um, replacing the current fleet with lease vehicles is for fiscal year 2022, we would anticipate uh, replacing seven vehicles. For 23, six vehicles. Fiscal year 24, seven additional vehicles. And for 25, three vehicles. The benefits for the lease funding option. First, there would be the coordination of maintenance. It would be through the leasing company for all police fleet vehicles. And this would be the um, data handling and the maintenance scheduling. There would be a quicker turnaround time for us to obtain our police vehicles due to using local upfitting businesses. In the past, we've used an upfitting business in Dallas, and this um, presents some delays for our department. The fleet will be replaced if it's determined that there is a maintenance, maintenance issue. The, uh, the leasing company actually would provide us with an analysis of each vehicle, and then it would be up to the city to determine if that's a path or what path they would like to take. There would be less worry about the safety and operation of an aging fleet, hence the vehicles would become more effective and efficient while in operation. Primarily, it would low lower our maintenance cost. There would also be a quicker turnover rate for diminishing vehicles with less upfront capital needed. There would be less involvement from patrol officers taken away from their primary duties involved in um, picking up and managing these vehicles. And then the best thing would be there would only be one invoice generated by the, uh, the leasing company for all the maintenance costs per month. Did Ms. Waldron pay you to say that was the best part? You know, I actually practiced her part just in case she didn't show up and I could talk about capital outlay, so just in case. <laughs> The enterprise maintenance program, the full maintenance program can be used for all vehicles if we participate in their maintenance management program. Non-pursuit vehicles, which would be our criminal investigative division vehicles and our administrative vehicles, their costs can be included in the leasing program uh, with the exclusion of brakes and tires. Enterprise would man manage the maintenance program by assigning a specific individual to the lease and they have identified at least eight providers in our area that they would work with. Enterprise would deal directly with the providers and pay the invoices, and it would cost us $6 per unit per month. The maintenance data is tracked by Enterprise and available to the city via a, um, their web page, and also they have a downloadable app, so an officer can log into the app and, and look at their vehicle and see that there's an oil change due in two weeks. The next steps would be for us to bring to council a resolution on July 27th to authorize, um, for the city manager to authorize, as I said, a resolution to authorize city manager to execute 
all agreements relating to the leasing program. Fiscal year 2022 proposed budget assumes capital savings from no vehicle acquisition and lower maintenance costs with the same level of lease payments coming out of the general fund. We would order the first year replacement vehicles with a six month lead time. And then this would also give us the opportunity to evaluate the maintenance program for future use in other departments within the city of Bastrop. And that is it. Council, do you have any questions for the chief? Mayor Pro Tem Nelson? What is the industry standard for life on a, on a police vehicle? So it kind of depends. Um, when I researched it, uh, for the most part, it just depends on the size of the department. Ours are ran pretty hard, but typically it's about four to five years. And currently we have everything from five to about 13 years. Yeah, I was shocked to see a 13 year mm -hmm. vehicle there. <laughs> yes, sir. Has Enterprise given you any, any indication of their replacement of the lease vehicles? Will it be on a temporal basis or will it be based on mileage or just the maintenance of that vehicle? or a combination of their own. I believe it's a combination, but it would depend on what's in our agreements. And I think at this point, it would be up to the city whether it would be a four or five year agreement. That's right. And our, my experience with this, and this is consistent with what uh, Chief Stefanik and uh, CFO Waldron have been working on with Enterprise. Enterprise will make, or the potential vendor here, will make some suggestions and they'll present to us a plan and that's good information for us to have but what we actually do on an annual basis moving forward is up to us in terms of that rate of replacement. Yeah, great. I, I, this, I, the preventative maintenance aspect of it is, is going to be a cost saving to the city. So thank you very much. That yes, is sir. the primary benefit of this. Yes, sir. Uh, the primary benefit of this to the department would be just the, the maintenance cost lowering and there, the management also. There's, there's a short term benefit associated with with cash flow, we get into the leases more cheaply than we would otherwise, and that's what Ms. Waldron was saying earlier. Over, over time, that benefit kind of goes away, frankly, but what, what lasts is that maintenance benefit. We'll, we'll do a better job of it and we'll save cost uh, because it's managed for us. And that maintenance benefit just turns into dependability of the unit Absolutely. for the, our police force, which yes, I think sir. is huge. Thank you so much, Chief Stefanik. Council Member Crouch? I was just wondering, uh, what is there a mileage requirement with the, with the lease, like in a typical uh, uh, I'm sorry, you said a model requirement? A mileage. Oh, mileage. mileage. Uh -huh. uh, as far as I know, no, sir. So typically, the analysis we did on our vehicles is we average about 12,000 miles per year on our vehicles, um, but as far as I know, there is not a requirement. Mm -hmm. Council Member Jackson? Uh, I agree that the, um, the maintenance is a big part of this uh, contract and leasing. Uh, I just had a simple question about branding or the, the uh, you know, identification of the vehicles or anything. Is that something that, um, how, is, how is that handled? I didn't see that or maybe I overlooked it as far as how we will change out the vehicles from time to time with the uh, new logos and things like that. As far as, um, would we change it from what it currently is? Or well, I don't know what, what it is currently. He's pretty much hoping that it doesn't say Enterprise Rental Vehicle <laughs> on the side, I think is part of the point. If, no, sir, it, it would not say Enterprise in big, huge letters. Oh, For the most part, was, the, only I, thinking, <laughs> the only thing I would like is some uh, consistency. So everything has to stay the same and, and stay recognizable for the public. I guess what I'm trying to ask, I'm trying to figure out since I'm not making myself clear, uh, how expensive is that for this? I mean, since we would be leasing and changing them out, is that just, I mean, that's just a startup cost on any new vehicle, though, too. It is, complete. yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So the design and the graphics on the vehicle is, is just standard. Um, it's, it's pretty minimal compared to some of the outfitting <clears throat> equipment that we put on the vehicles. So whether we purchase the vehicles or release the vehicles, it would be the same, same amount. Okay. Is that the answer to <laughs> the question? I'll, 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 I'll find out more later. I'm just trying to, I guess, more specifics, and I didn't, I should have asked earlier, but I'll, I'll talk to you later about it. Yes, sir. Yeah, technology's really come a long way, and it, it, they look really fancy, but it's really not that much money from mm -hmm. what I've seen of uh, past bids. All right, Council, any other questions for Chief? Excellent right. job. Thank we'll you see guys. you on the 27th. Okay, it is 626.
And um, we're gonna start our regular meeting at 6.30. If you are in the room and you are wanting to speak on an item and you have not filled out a form, please do so. Those forms are located in the back. And um, if you will please turn those in, they look like this. If you will turn them in to the city secretary, we'll make sure that we get those taken care of. Um, and we are gonna take a real quick a three minute recess, but we will start the regular meeting at 630. at our city council meeting the city of bastrop reserves the right to reconvene recess or realign the regular session or called executive session or order of business at any time prior to adjournment i have um, we we have called this meeting to order we have a full dais and we've got we're going to go through we're in the middle of page two there's some standard things that we do we're going to say the pledge and we're going to say some things but i know there's some folks who are not used to being at council meetings and we have um you've uh, we have ended up with we've got kind of two big main things going on so i want to tell people what is happening and uh, you heard me talking to a couple of different people I know there are a number of you that are here for item 13D. It is almost exactly the number of community support organizations that are here to make their annual presentation. So um, those organizations and several of them, hi you guys, good to see them, are gonna have three minutes. What I am telling you is item 10A what you may not have realized if you didn't look at the packet, item 10A is going to take a good solid 30, 45 minutes. So, and if we, if we flip it to 13D with the same number of people signed up and with the presentation and that the applicant's going to make and staff is going to make, that's a 30 to 45 minute presentation. So uh, if, if you want to take a lunch break, if you want to take a dinner break, I don't believe we will be to 13D before 730. And if some of you choose to, you're welcome to stay. I'm not kicking anyone out. But if you, do, if you want a break, I promise we will not start 13D before 730. So I'm just, you're welcome to stay, but if you want to have a quick break, we can do that. So, and please, please, if you are here and you wish to speak on any item, um, I really need you, it was technically 6.30, but I, I wanna make sure anybody that wants to speak gets the opportunity to speak. Please get your um, stuff turned into the city secretary and there are blanks in the back. And if we run out, um, our assistant city manager, Rebecca Gleason, will help you guys get signed up. So with that, if you are here, I would appreciate it if you would stand and we are gonna say our Pledge of Allegiance. If you would please remain standing, we'll have our invocation by Chaplain Cliff Sparks. Chaplain Sparks. Let us pray. Father God, we invite you and welcome your presence here. We thank you for being here. Lord, we ask that you bless everyone here that's answered your call to leading this community and serving this community ask that you bless them with the wisdom to continue to make the right and good decisions for the benefit of all in a spirit of peace and goodwill and harmony. And Lord, thank you for every good thing you've given us. 
Lord, and right now we just thank you for this rain and the cool temperatures. And in thinking of that, we ask that you would send your divine assistance to those on the West Coast that are going through what this community did 10 years ago. Lord, we thank you for every good thing that you've sent down to us, for your righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Spirit. And we just bless you and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much, Chaplain Sparks. We appreciate you taking time to do that for us. All right, Colin, we're going to rock and roll on my mayor's report. Before I get started, I did want to share with any veterans in the audience that the Workforce Solutions is having a veteran summer job fair, and it is on July 15th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And um, so if you know any veterans or spouses that are uh, looking for employment, I would encourage you to participate in that. Okay, Colin, you want to go to the next item? This is what I always do this every time to just show you a little bit of some of the things that I've been involved with. In the upper left-hand corner, Kay Sapikas, we all know her uh, being associated with the Museum and Visitor Center, and she has uh, decided to uh, do something different. She's going to stay in Bastrop, but she's not going to be in that role anymore. And on June 25th, they had a going away for her, and that was a picture of her at her party. It's always nice to see her. Colin, if you'll go below that. I, I, even though I'm the mayor of Bastrop, I still do fun things in other cities sometime. And um, one of our residents, Hannibal Lacumbe, climbed the water tower and played his trumpet. And that's a picture of me, and you can barely see Hannibal up there, but it was a great concert. It was a neat thing, and the impressive thing is that Hannibal has a fear of heights, so we all take care of things. Um, if you go to the top in the middle, several of you watched on July 2nd when it was KVU's Daybreak. They came to Bastrop, and they did their entire show from from Bastrop right there on the corner and you see some behind the scene pictures and the, the picture of them in our e-cab that says visit Bastrop was their closing shot. So really highlighted Bastrop and we got a lot of really nice positive feedback from that. Below that, I went to the Farm Street Opry that is always the first Thursday of every month. That was a really good time. And if you've not joined us, I would encourage you, if you like live music, live country music, come out and see us. And in the upper right-hand corner, a couple of shots from our Patriotic Festival. I'm sure our city manager will talk about that some more. But um, had to highlight not only the red, white, and blue Corvettes, to remind everyone that the Corvette invasion is this weekend, um, but also our wonderful new piece of fire equipment and the huge American flag that was on display as people entered the Patriotic Festival. That was always a fun thing. And then just below that, some of you know that my very sweet husband bought me a 57 Chevy for my 57th birthday, because that's what all good husbands do. And I participated in a car show at Silver Pines on June 18th, and the residents at Silver Pines Nursing Home came out. We had 18, about 18 cars out there, and it was really great to see their faces light up, and, and you could see, boy, the memories kicking in. I had a car like that. My grandma had a, you know. It was, it was really a fun day, and I enjoyed doing that. Um, I, okay, Colin, we can go to the next page. I always give you guys an idea of what I'm going to do um, because this was a part of the regular packet. I did go to the ribbon cutting and I got to host about 13 youngsters yesterday that asked me all kinds of questions. It was really fun and I'll show you some pictures of that at our next council meeting. If you look at the upcoming events, I will highlight council for you that um, there is a TML Region 10 meeting on July 20th. Uh, you see a couple of ribbon cuttings. Also on July 27th, there will be a ribbon cutting at um, Chick-fil-A, and that, I, that hadn't been scheduled when I put my report together. So that's all I have for my mayor's report. And Councilmember Jackson, what have you got for your Councilmember report? Uh, just that uh, I think you had noted about the TML board meeting that we both attended uh, a couple of weeks ago, I guess, or something like that. And just wanted to say that uh, our state senator, Sarah Eckhart, was in town on um, 
July the 8th, and I had the pleasure of uh, welcoming her to Bastrop, and she was at one of my community meetings, and it was, uh, it was on the first day of the special session, and so she kind of gave our group an update on what was happening with the uh, session, and uh, even though she'd been there all day, she still came in that evening and did a spe special meeting with us, and that was very helpful. Uh, that's it. Thank you, Council Member Jackson. Council Member Crouch? Um, I've uh, been gathering a bunch of information and research on uh, playing fields uh, for the city, so maybe we can present that at some point in time uh, so we can have some cost and some ideas for some future uh, sports playing fields. And then also in that same realm, uh, a bike pass uh, in the city. So I've contacted uh, Bike Texas and Bike Austin to uh, see what we can do to help make our city a little more bike friendly. And um, so they've been real responsive with that and then have some great ideas for the city that I can share at some point as well. That's it. Thank you, Council Member Crouch. Mayor Pro Tem Nelson. Other than attending a couple of regional meetings as well as some local meetings with our chamber and getting dunked last Saturday, I have nothing else to report. You are a very good sport about that, and there were, I'm sure there are pictures available. Councilmember Rogers. It was a good video of watching you get dumped. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. We do have a Main Street meeting tomorrow, so I can report back on next council meeting on what Main Street's all busy with. Excellent. Councilmember Peterson. Thank you, Mayor. Nothing tonight. All right. City Manager, we are a 9C. It is yours. And then uh, to take your cue on talking about the July 3rd Patriotic Fest, we have a video that we're going to present here. It's just a couple minutes long. It was produced by the Bastrop Chamber of Commerce. Uh, uh, Ms. Womble's in the room. I think I saw her earlier. Thank you, Becky, for providing this. And we'll show that right now, Colin, and then we'll go from there. Thank you, and thank you, Becky, for putting that together. Uh, Council Member Crouch just mentioned, I don't know if people could hear it, that was good to see the long list of sponsors. And Council Members, if you haven't seen the this month's uh, Chamber newsletter, uh, Ms. Womble spends quite a bit of time in there thanking the city of Bastrop for the city's efforts in pulling all this together. Certainly a, a community-wide effort with a lot of volunteers, um, 
a lot of city employees, in fact, about 240 uh, total hours of staff time associated with uh, helping out and being there for the event. And there was a tremendous city staff presence, police department, fire department, public works department, and BPNL. And so we'll certainly keep that up for, for future years. So uh, thank you again, Chamber of Commerce, for, for all of that and for acknowledging the, the city's contribution to, to the effort. So council will talk briefly here about upcoming uh, uh, council meetings. Your next regular meeting is happening in two weeks as per normal. We've been busy for several weeks now, especially after our May 14th pre-budget planning session that we had with you preparing the annual uh, budget. I will be making that budget proposal formally um, next week at this meeting. You will also hear at the next meeting the annual uh, funding requests from our community assets, the, uh, the, the, the museum, the opera house, and the art center. And while they're doing that, they'll also give you their most recent quarterly report. You'll also receive quarterly reports from Visit Bastrop in the Economic Development Corporation. You heard the presentation from Chief Stefanik and, Ch and CFO Waldron a few minutes ago about the idea to lease police vehicles. We're going to ask you to approve that resolution that Chief Stefanik talked about earlier on July the 27th. And this next item is a state law kind of technicality. We need to officially designate the tax assessor collector to calculate our tax rate, and so we'll ask you to take care of that. Uh, we have an agreement with Bastrop County for the 911 addressing service they provide. We'll ask you to consider you approve it, assuming you approve a budget amendment that's on this evening's agenda. Second reading will be on July 27th. There is a proposed municipal utility district um, um, in the city's extraterritorial ter jurisdiction off of FM 812. Um, not that close to the city, but it is in the city's ETJ. It is outside of our CCN area. Um, they would like to make a presentation to the city council, and so find that that will happen. The staff has not had much opportunity to review the details here, but we're going to um, have them present what they are all about at your next meeting. And uh, Another item on tonight's agenda, the mayor mentioned this earlier, is a public hearing and um, the opportunity for council to consider a development agreement for that Viridian property, that 409 acres off of 969. Our, our schedule includes having you approve that professional services agreement. Uh, council, you've done that sort of thing before. That's where the property owner and developer uh, assures that they cover the cost of our re our review of all of the financials associated with that development. So a lot of things for July 27th, um, and I'll go one more meeting, your August 10th meeting. It's time for uh, my six-month review. Uh, you will receive our third quarter Mr. Report. Hoffman, I know time flies, but that will be your one-year review. But it's been six months <laughs> since you reviewed me. So yes, yes, yes ma'am. That it, it is. And it's been a great one year. Can I just go ahead and start, start the good vibes right, right now? Um, we will ask you to do the annual review of your financial management and purchasing policies. Uh, you will, uh, this is another gift from the state legislature and their efforts to make all of this more transparent. We need you to vote to have a meeting to set the tax rate. And we'll ask you to do that, and, uh, and we have a supervisory uh, control and data acquisition system, SCADA for short, that requires maintenance, and significantly so, and we're going to ask you to approve that contract on August 10th. And then just real quickly from there, we've got a couple of budget workshops set aside um, on our strategic calendar. Um, on Tuesday, August 17th, is workshop number one. And Council, this is flexible and we can certainly change things around, but uh, a suggestion for that workshop day is that we talk about uh, what you're going to hear tonight, the funding request for uh, community support uh, organizations and the assets you'll hear about from next time. Uh, we'll update you from May 14th on where we are with the capital plan. 
Uh, I know you've got questions about fees, and we've got some updates to the comprehensive fee list, and we'll go over all that and, of course, answer any questions that you ask uh, before that meeting. And as necessary, we can have a, another workshop that next day, and right now that's just about answering your questions. And I think that's my last slide. Thank you, City Manager. City Secretary, it would be helpful if we could get August 17th and 18th on our council yes, shared calendar so that we block that and we don't end up with that schedule. And I, I spoke too soon. That actually wasn't my last slide. Call if you don't mind. And another item we will put on your calendar just as soon as we confirm visit Bastrop. We are contractually obligated to an annual joint meeting between the council and the Visit Bastrop Board, and right now we're targeting August 23rd for that. We'll, we will confirm that, and if confirmed, and in the meantime, let us know if you've got a conflict with that evening, um, but that's what we're targeting right now. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. I just know, Council, for all of us, the sooner it gets on our calendar, the better off we are, and, and I appreciate as much advance notice as possible. All right, Council, we're moving on to item 9D, present Bastrop Independent School District Community Partner Recognition. I saw Dr. Lee. Oh, and there's April Buck. You guys come forward. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Thank you all for having us. We were um, honored to be able to come here, even though you could not join us at our meeting next week, to come here, and this is maybe even better, to present uh, this, this award. I am Christy Lee. I'm the Associate Superintendent for Communications and Community Relations, and I'm here with um, April Lewandowski, who is our Community Engagement Coordinator, and uh, honored to announce that uh, the City of Bastrop is our Community Partner of the Year. And I want to tell you a little bit about why. Um, I don't even think I have a complete list, and April's going to help me out here, but um, I know that uh, City Manager Hoffman, you allowed us to use the Convention Center for Winter Blast when we had, uh, you know, we're struggling to find that location in the midst of COVID to still be able to give out um, coats and toys and all of that good stuff. Um, Ashton LaFuente and Rebecca Gleason participated in our Human Resources Recruiting video so that we could find the best and the brightest teachers to come to Bastrop. Um, Mayor, you have done countless uh, interviews and volunteer uh, activities, not only with Circa, but some other things that April will talk about. You've been to our board meetings when we've needed you to come and speak before the board. Um, you all agreed to have the Bastrop Youth Advisory Council, and even though we didn't get to meet all of this this year and some months, we're getting that back up and started again, and we appreciate that you allow that opportunity for our youth to have a voice here in Bastrop. Um, Rebecca Gleason provided uh, tote bags with a great uh, tumbler and a personal note to every single person who was selected as Teacher of the Year this year. Now, two of those people have left, so I don't know if that's a correlation or not, <laughs> but I just, but we appreciate uh, the, all of the effort that was put into that. And it's been mentioned a couple of times, but um, we had the dunking booth at the Patriotic Festival, and that is an initiative of the Bastrop Chamber of Commerce. However, um, the, the, the initiative that benefits is we believe in BISD. And so I just want to say that uh, Chief Nagy, Assistant Chief Stefanik, um, Assistant Chief uh, Diarmit, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Nelson, City Manager Paul Hoffman, all of you participated, and I don't know that all of you got dunked, I can't remember, but I think everyone got dunked at least one time. And then I also want to mention um, uh, Chief Rosales was supposed to be in the dunking tank, but I don't know if he manufactured an event that was going on on the other side of the park, but uh, Sergeant Charles Sanford stepped in and uh, he got dunked a lot. Um, and I know April has some of the things she wants to share as well. Hi, good evening. Um, for those of you that don't know, um, Mayor Schrader voluntarily agreed to uh, participate in a cahoot with our ACE after school students and she was defeated um, in the topic of Harry Potter. Um, and they loved it. I had students emailing me asking, is the mayor coming back? I'm sorry I missed it. Um, I also would like to give recognition to you, um, to uh, Ms. Gleason, also Ashton LaFuente, and uh, Chief Nagy. 
and several members of the library staff for serving as celebrity guest judges for our Ego, uh, Ace Lego uh, competition. Um, the kids were so excited to um, construct different um, Lego challenges and to present them to you virtually. And it's important for those students because they're at home doing virtual schooling and so to still get that community interaction even though they're at home um, was just wonderful for them. So thank you so much. On behalf of Bastrop ISD, to the city of Bastrop, and uh, all of you sitting here, but also all of your staff from all departments, we sincerely appreciate this partnership. It is what makes Bastrop really special, um, and, and we appreciate you. And we have an award to give you. Yay, thank you so much, Dr. Lee. I, there is nothing more important. The, the school district, although it goes well outside the city limits, it, when people say, I go to school in Bastrop, it, we're all Bastrop. And it, you are a vital part and a vital partner. And we just so much appreciate the partnership that we have together. So thank you guys so very much. All right, those Lego challenges are really, really fun, and I've shared some of those pictures, Council, on during my mayor's report. All right, for anybody who has come in later, we are on item 10A. We are going to go, there's about 13 of them. We are gonna hear from our, um, the organizations that support and do things for our citizens that um, the city ends up funding a portion of their um, overall budget. When we get done with item 10A, we are going to move to item 13D. I'm making sure I'm saying that right, yes. From 10A, we will move to item 13D. I will not start 13D before 7.30, and since it's 6.57, there's no chance we're gonna start before 7.30. So if you wanna take a little break, you're welcome to do that. I also apologize, I meant to mention this sooner. Item 13C, has been pulled by the applicant. There's some things that they're still wanting to do, so if you are here for item 13C, that has been pulled. And I am so sorry, I admit, we're gonna do you first. We always take care of consultants that the taxpayers are paying for their time because you guys want us to get them out of the room. So we are going to item 13A. Colin, sorry for hopping around on you. Consider action to approve ordinance number 202109 of the City Council of the City of Bastrop, Texas, authorizing the issuance of the City of Bastrop, Texas Combination Tax and Revenue Certificates of Obligation Series 2021 to fund water and wastewater system improvements and fence replacement in the Hunters Crossing Public Improvement District, levying an ad valorem tax and pledging certain surplus revenues in support of the certificates, approving an official statement, a paying agent registrar agreement, and other agreements relating to the sale and issuance of certificates, and ordaining other matters relating to the issuance of certificates, repealing all ordinances, actions in, com in conflict herewith, and providing for an effective date. Ms. Waldron. It's a mouthful. Um, we'll set this up very quickly. Um, we've talked about this um, in, on several occasions. Um, but this is finally the sale. The sale was done this morning. I have our financial advisor and our bond council here to uh, present the results and answer any questions. Uh, but it is for the 75 million that will be uh, for water, wastewater infrastructure, continuing to provide funding for the wastewater treatment plan and the start of the water treatment plant, and then the 700,000 for the fence replacement. Thank you, Tracy. Mayor, Council, City Manager, Dan Wegmiller with Specialized Public Finance. Um, as, as Tracy mentioned, today is the final day. We've discussed this a couple times, but we received bids this morning at 10 a.m. 
Uh, we um, had the bond rating affirmed at AA, uh, which again, you chose to use certificates of obligation to use that higher bond rating, basically self-insure. The four bidders that submitted chose not to use bond insurance uh, because they're relying on your AA strong tax back credit. Uh, for the projects, uh, the four bidders were Fidelity Capital Markets, R.W. Barrett and Company, Hilltop Securities, and Citigroup Capital Markets. Uh, the low bid was 2.197440%. Um, these, uh, these certificates go out to 2051, and it's obviously still incredibly low interest rate environment. So, uh, with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions on the bids that were received, but we recommend accepting Fidelity Capital Markets and the bid of 2.19744%. Uh, Bart Fowler with McCall Parkhurst, your bond counsel, is here if you have any questions regarding the ordinance. Council, any questions for Mr. Waymeyer? I move to approve. I have a motion to approve from Councilmember Rogers. Second. I have a second from Councilmember Jackson. Is there any further discussion? Mayor, I just would like to re 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 remind everyone that the $700,000 of it from Hunter's Crossing for this bond isn't being paid by the tax, the tax, the taxpayers is being paid by Hunter's Crossing. So I just want to make sure everybody remembered that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. They're, we're helping. We're, it's like we're letting them use our credit card, but they are paying the bill. That's absolutely. All right. Any further discussion? Thank you for that reminder, Councilmember Rogers. Madam Secretary, if you'll call the roll. Councilmember Rogers. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Crouch. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Nelson. Uh, as a property owner in the Hunters Cross, I'm going to abstain. Councilmember Peterson. Yes. Thank you, Council. The motion passes with four, four and one abstention. So we are done with item 13A. Now we are going to item 10A. Sorry, Colin. All right, 10A, presentation from organizations applying for the fiscal year 22 community support funding. And I, always, I never know if I should continue to go in alphabetical order. I know, but, it's, but I think we're going to do reverse of alphabetical order. We're going to shake it up. And that, so I've made half of them mad and half of them really happy. So we're going to start with Pines and Prairie Land Trust. Do we have anyone here to present for Pines and Prairie? And just a reminder, we are truly encourage folks to keep their comments brief and to specifically emphasize how the funds benefit citizens of the city of Bastrop. Thank you. And if you please tell us your name. Melanie Pavlis. I'm executive director of Pines and Prairies Land Trust. Thank you, Mayor and Council members. Um, next slide, please. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Is this the control? Okay. Okay, so uh, we are requesting funding from the community support uh, grant to help manage the Colorado River Refuge. And this property is 65 acres along the Colorado River in Tahitian Village subdivision. We uh, own and manage this property. It's free and open to the public every day. It has uh, hiking, hike and bike trails, uh, access to the river, and we estimate uh, 1,000 people or so visit the property monthly. And uh, Pines and Prairies Land Trust is committed to protecting this property in perpetuity. The benefits that the uh, Colorado River Refuge, or the CRR, have to the community include access to nature, access to the Colorado River. We offer free nature classes for children twice a year, um, with most recently over 60 unique students that attend, and that is growing. Um, we support a volunteer program that uh, hosts over 20 Bastrop citizen volunteers and they have logged 460 volunteer hours in the past year. And more recently, we've been partnering with Bird City Bastrop to offer birding hikes at the Colorado River Refuge. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> 
So we are requesting up to $25,000 from the uh, community support program that will cover staff management of uh, the refuge, ongoing maintenance, and two large projects. For staff time, we are asking for approximately $7,500 to support staff that will coordinate the nature lessons, our volunteer program, uh, protecting the natural resources of the property, and uh, repairing infrastructure and dealing with bad actors. For ongoing maintenance, we're uh, requesting support to for items like removing graffiti, repairing and maintaining the trails so that they are usable uh, to the public at all times. Um, we have seen a, a double in uh, use of our trash um, receptacles needing um, the, our trash service to come twice uh, instead of uh, one time a week. Um, we are also deal with a lot of uh, trespass and encroachment that we've been having to deal with recently and ongoing erosion control. And finally, we're asking for funding to support two larger projects at the preserve. One of them is a diversion dam that's located along one of our trails. And it, um, floodwaters will flow into the diversion dam and, and swirl and slow down and um, dump out into a wetland that eventually goes to the Colorado River. And this diversion dam um, gets a lot of debris from flooding events. And we just don't have the capacity to get equipment out there um, to free up the dam. Um, and the benefits of having that dam are for local flood mitigation as well as downstream flood mitigation. And then the biggest project we are requesting uh, support for is repaving one of our trailheads. Thank you. And as you can see here, it's uh, an area that has ongoing erosion problems, and it's gotten to the point where we are going to have to um, get engineers involved and do a more permanent fix for it because e even our trash pickup service can't get in and out of that um, parking area. And this is just a breakdown of, of the numbers that we're requesting. And um, thank you for your time and uh, um, consideration. Thank you very much. Council, any questions? Okay, we are moving on. And um, for everyone in the audience to know, the application that they made is in the packet. So council's reviewed all of the information that they've submitted. So that's why they're gonna be just summarizing their request. In the street, hands up high, Pastor Nava. Thank you, Mayor, City Manager, City Council. Um, we're coming today to what we're seeking support from the city council is to uh, continue to doing the services that we've been doing. Uh, as y'all know, Industries Hands Up High Ministry started the open door soup kitchen that used to be on Chestnut. Now we're on Highway 95, but we're still serving Bastrop City. Uh, we're still looking to get a vehicle to pick up. Right now we're using personal vehicles to pick up people here in the city, but uh, we're also uh, continue to house uh, not just homeless people, but people that are going through hardships in the Bastrop City as well as Bastrop County. And currently we are working with BISD and the Catholic Youth Group. We are working on some shelters right now uh, for the homeless high school seniors. And so working with Norma Mercado, Homeless Liaison, and uh, the Catholic Church uh, Youth Group. And we recently put two uh, disabled veteran shelters on the property as well. And so we continue to need to do upkeep on those as well. And also uh, there's two uh, trailers we put on the property on the other side uh, that we're housing larger families that are too large to go inside the shelters. And so we're working on that. And we're currently right now still serving bag lunches at the Methodist Church on Fridays. Uh, Calvary Episcopal Church on uh, Thursdays, and we're looking to do another uh, location here in the city, and that's during the day at lunchtime. And it's not just for the people that are homeless. There are people that are just in need right now 
that uh, faced a lot of hard times through the COVID and the freeze and other things that they're going through. And so that's the whole purpose of us being here and coming and seeking support that we can continue to do this service that the Lord has put in my heart to continue to do here in Bastrop. And so that's all I can say. I can keep on talking, I talk a lot. <laughs> but, uh, but that's the main goal is to continue to be uh, of service to the people of Bastrop City, and that's the purpose of seeking uh, support. Thank you, Pastor yeah. Nava. Council, any questions? It's great to see you. Great to see you both. All right, feed the need. Good evening, everybody, and Good to thank see you. you for hearing us all out. Um, again, thank you each and every year for what you do for nonprofits like ours and like all the ones represented here today. Our city is a great place to live because you guys invest in those and invest into our people. And so it's with honor and thankfulness and gratitude that we are here. So the biggest notice change that you guys will notice um, is the amount of difference. So we've been consistently in that $5,000 to $8,000 range. And so that basically is paid for food. And what has happened over the past two years is we have really invested in our training. We have over 150 individual volunteers each and every single week. And to train those volunteers so that we can meet more than just the physical need of food, it takes a lot of time, it took a lot of resources. And so now the reason we are asking for that 34 is because we have fully implemented that training program into our operations. And so it's running. So that $34,000 number has been coming in the past from our corporate funds, which we also use to help build new programs like the Gobble Kit program that we've seen the past couple of years, where we did 732 families and provided them a turkey and all the fixings in this city. And so with that, we want to be able to free up those corporate funds to be able to continue to grow those programs and also take what we've started here in Bastrop. This was our test ground. This is where we started and this is home but now we're gonna spread it across the country. And so any corporate funds that we can free up, we would be very appreciative of that. And so, you guys have any questions? Good job. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. All right, one, one close to my heart, CASA. Court appointed special advocates. Good evening. Um, I, I too wanna to, uh, stress uh, the importance and thank you for the funding that we have received in the past. Um, for those who don't know me, um, I'm Christy Glassford. I'm the executive director for CASA. And CASA is short for Court Appointed Special Advocates. And our mission is to advocate for the best interest for children and families. Now we've added that to our mission statement um, that experienced child abuse and neglect. And so over the, when I uh, presented our packet um, at that time, we have served a total of 302 children um, this fiscal year. We have increased that number by 10. Unfortunately, um, about 200 of those children are from Bastrop County alone. 70 are within the city limits of Bastrop. And so um, our mission is that we recruit the volunteers, we train them, and they go visit these children where they're placed. Uh, we have children who are placed all over the state of Texas. We have children who are placed in Michigan. We have a child who's now placed in Arkansas. And so wherever these children go, we go. Um, we are the one consistent person that stays with these children from the moment that they enter the foster care system till their permanency is found. And whether that permanency be back with um, their parents, which is our number one goal, um, sometimes that doesn't happen. Um, we stay with them and help choose their adoptive family um, and, and provide them with their forever home. And so it's important work that we do. The funding that we receive from you all has supported um, background checks we we our, our volunteers have to go through a series of background checks so that that some of that funding has helped with the support of you all also to help support our families who take in these kids um, we we have used some of the funding from you all to help support um, those families um, granny and grandpa aunts and uncles um, we have uh, grandparents who sometimes get five grandchildren uh, dropped in their home and they're on a fixed income so now you have five children and so we want to help we're not the only resource we want to be a partnership and resources that help continue to keep these children um, with family um, if, if many of you have read uh, CPS is in crisis right now um, you know our main thing if we have any child in crisis that's been neglected or abused that's a crisis but 
I'm going to take that a step further. We have children who are now living in the CPS offices. We have four children who are living here in the CPS office in Bastrop. And so it's not, um, it's not just here. Um, we have 19, I think the last count I heard, 19 that are living in the CPS office in Austin. And so our role that we play um, with that is if it's our kids, we are visiting with those kids, trying to find a friend, a family member, someone that maybe they haven't thought of before that we could reach out and try to get those kids out of those situations and placed with, um, with a family or friends. So, you know, that, that's not all this funding is for. Um, you know, there's a variety of things that we do, mileage to go visit the kids, you know, the staff members that we have. And, and one of the things that we do realize is that as the city of Bastrop grows, we will see some of that negative growth, unfortunately, and we want to put ourselves in a position to be able to support those kids and those families. So I appreciate you all for, for allowing us to present funding to you all again. And any questions? Thank you, Ms. Okay. Glasper. Thank you. Appreciate that. Combined community action. Hello. Uh, Karen Walpole, Communications Director for Combined Community Action and Meals on Wheels rural capital area. I would like to start by thanking, uh, thanking you, Mayor and Council Members, for your continued support of our programs. We serve to provide food to our elderly communities. Uh, we provide, um, ideally under normal circumstances, five meals a day that are hot. Uh, due to COVID, of course, that changed. And so we changed to providing frozen meals for five days a week as well as shelf-stable meals trying to carry over in the other times when people would need to have food. Uh, our goal here is to, one, create independence for our elderly community, to allow them to remain in place in their homes where they know and are comfortable, uh, to relieve any and some, hopefully, some food insecurities, any would be great, um, as well as to keep that contact going with that person, keep them in communication with somebody that knows them. Our volunteers get to know them and are able to know if there's something going on, if they need additional care, maybe we need to get referrals in, um, and just making sure that we're there as much as we can be to provide for uh, these residents. Uh, we are requesting uh, $8,000, and that will go directly to the cost of meals. Uh, in the city of Bastrop alone in 2020, we served 14,000 meals uh, to 80 clients, so between the frozen and the shelf stable, so um, it, uh, it it grow, the number grows pretty quickly. Uh, we don't necessarily uh, know how that's going to change going forward. We're very hopeful to reopen our congregate location, which is held at the settlements, uh, the settlement apartments. Um, that will be our first step back to some type of normalcy for our clients. Uh, we're really excited and looking forward to that. Um, but that's the primary thing that. Uh, that our request is for. It's directly for meals. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Children's Advocacy Center. I saw Megan. There she is. Hi there. Good evening. I was very worried that I would be called upon to go first, so I appreciate, Mayor, <laughs> that you... Anything for you, Mayor. That you changed things up. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad we communicated on that. Uh, so, for those who don't know, the Children's Advocacy Center exists to provide a coordinated, family-focused approach to the epidemic of child abuse in our community. And what we strive to do is to reduce trauma, seek justice, foster healing, and cultivate empowerment for children and families. Um, over the past year, we've utilized the funding from the city of Bastrop to assist us in expanding our operations. Uh, many of us know, many know us for being in the little yellow house on Chestnut Street, but we've actually made a move recently, thankfully. Um, and so we were able to use the funding to kind of expand our operations um, and the services that we're offering to children and families. In 2020, in partnership with Bastrop Police Department, we provided the following services to the residents of the city of Bastrop. 56 forensic interviews of child victims and witnesses to abuse. Eight sexual assault forensic examinations for children. 437 individual child therapy sessions, 183 family therapy sessions, and in addition, we provided family advocacy services for all those parties um, and community outreach and education within the city of Bastrop. So, as you're aware, our community is continuing to grow, and that means the needs of the Children's Advocacy Center um, are continuing to grow and changing rapidly. In May of 2021, as I said, we were able to make the move to a new building 
And through that move, we were able to accomplish a few things that were badly needed. We expanded our forensic interviewing capabilities by adding an additional forensic interview and observation suite. We grew our on-site medical examination program. We actually have a sexual assault nurse examiner that is in the office weekly staffing that room. We created a family advocacy pantry that has food, clothing, and household essentials for families. And we launched our on-site therapeutic wing where we offer trauma-focused individual and family therapy right here in the city of Bastrop. So unfortunately, as with many people, the financial fallout from the COVID-19 crisis has resulted in a drop in state and federal level grants funding for us at a time when our community is growing faster than ever and the need for services is at its most critical. Um, we've remained open and actually expanded operations throughout the crisis and we expect that that expansion is gonna need to continue. Currently, we have 70 plus child victims of abuse and trauma awaiting therapeutic care on our wait list. And so we have the space now to provide critical services to, the, to those children and their families, but we need the workforce to staff it. So the funding we're seeking from the city of Bastrop would be utilized specifically to fund those critical therapy services. And an increase in our community funding would improve our ability to expand into our new space and reduce those wait times for therapy. Thank you. Thank you, Megan, you did great. Thanks. All right, council, any questions? All right. Okay, Bastrop Pregnancy Resource Center. Hi. Hello. Good evening, everyone. My name is Katina White Higgins, and I am the Director of Development for the Bastrop Pregnancy Resource Center. Um, I'll dive right in. <laughs> Uh, with this year's funding from the city of Bastrop, the Bastrop Pregnancy Resource Center was able to help many non-clients during the pandemic's peak um, by giving out diapers, wipes, and formula. Um, we gave out 14 car seats uh, to clients and individuals with emergent needs. Um, from October 1st, uh, 2020 to present, we've had 91 unique clients and with 259 total client visits. Um, out of those numbers, the unique clients seen within the Bastrop city limits were 18 and the total, uh, with a total of 48 visits. And so with received grant funds beginning in the city of Bastrop's fiscal year of 10-1 up until today, we've purchased uh, a computer for showing client classes, um, a subscription for a video conferencing with the client so that they can utilize our services from home and the classes. Um, pregnancy tests, the diapers, car seats, strollers, bottle sets, educational literature, and storage racks for clothing that we get donated in. Um, the overhead portion was allowed, uh, the overhead portion that was allowed was spent on the liability insurance for our organization. Uh, the remainder of funds will be spent on the yearly digital subscriptions for the educational classes for our clients and additional materials such as the car seats, cribs, and et cetera. Um, our challenges this year have been that, you know, keeping the bigger items in stock like the baby beds, and those are necessities, especially when dealing with people who are having to, you know, their babies sleep on the floor, you know, there are different circumstances that, that make that a very important item. and so. Um, our upcoming plans are to purchase a travel projector for off-site classes and presentations so that we can be in the schools and we can go and do presentations and they're more effective that way. Um, and to purchase, to also purchase four iPad tablets uh, to present online curriculum to our clients. We plan to continue to offer digital education and support to our clients uh, so that they, so we can continue to develop our clients spiritually and parentally, of course. Um, we want to also increase availability of larger material items, like I said before, like the baby beds and things like that, uh, and the strollers, because those are important too, especially for our parents who have to walk everywhere. That makes a big difference to have a stroller. So we also plan to add more streams to our online educational classes so that we increase the number of clients that we can see every day. Because of course, with the limited number, you know, we only can see so many a day, and so this would help, so. Thank you. Thank you very much, appreciate that. A great organization. All right, Bastrop County Women's Shelter, but most of us call it the Family Crisis Center. Sherry? Good evening, Mayor, City Council members. 
And thank you for the opportunity to be here and present our funding request, as well as for the many forms of support the city has provided to our agency over the years. As you're aware, Family Crisis Center exists to address the issues of domestic violence, sexual assault, dating violence, and stalking. You know, that's an unfortunate fact, and as much as we'd like to believe these uh, societal ills don't occur in our community, it's just not true. And needless to say, um, just like every individual business and entity, the past year and the pandemic has been um, and brought about many challenges uh, for our community as well as for the center. But thanks to the fortitude and commitment of our incredible staff, we were able to quickly and frequently adapt to the ever-changing protocols and uh, were able to provide these essential and vital services um, of, and keep them available 24-7 to those in need of crisis intervention, emergency shelter, and our other critical core services. You know, funding from the city um, helps support our receptionist who actually see every person that comes in the front door. And those receptionists uh, do, the, you know, the initial screening and the, take the hotline calls. Um, and so not only does that city funding help support their salaries, but that funding is also used as match for our Governor's Office Criminal Justice Division VOCA grant. Uh, and so in many ways that city funding just, you know, it's all those puzzle pieces coming together that are so important. I've provided a handout this evening uh, because I wanted to share with you um, what our services look like and I left it on your desk during the, the, the breaks. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and it shows a two-year comparison. I thought that was so vital because FY19 was what we would have called a normal year. Uh, and this reflects FY19 as well as FY20. And so certain areas of our, we had to really adapt certain areas of our service. And most of the things listed on here are unique client counts. But I also at the bottom give you a reflection of how those services were unique to City of Bastrop residents for both FY19 and FY20. And you'll see that for City of Bastrop, it didn't change that drastically because we were here and we were doing those services. The emergency shelter never shut down. Our, our emergency 24-hour availability was always there. So for victims of violence and abuse, we know that any external factors that add stress, isolation, and financial strain can create circumstances that further compromise victim safety and their sustainability. This pandemic had all of those elements and far more. During the stay-at-home orders and social distancing situations, the risk to victims of domestic violence were definitely on the rise. Abuse is about power and control, and domestic violence and other abuse perpetrators frequently use isolation, control, and control to intimidate and facilitate their abuse. And so this pandemic was the perfect um, ground nurturing for that. Our direct service staff witnessed and can attest to the escalation of violence during this time and these increased stressors. So tonight, as you snuggle into the comfort of your own bed, in the safety of your own home, please think of the 25 individuals that are staying in our shelter tonight. Uh, they do have a safe place tonight because of your support of our agency. Um, and please consider uh, our staff, who I call my heroes, they're busy ensuring that these services remain t available 24-7 for those who need them. And I thank you for that, and I'd be happy to address any questions about our agency, about our application, or anything in general. And I also invite you to call me sometime. I'd love to give you a tour of our main office, our shelter, our transitional housing program, any of the facilities, love for you to see them. Many of you have probably seen our thrift store, so uh, that is such a vital part of our agency as well. Yeah, the, the facilities that you provide are really impressive. I've enjoyed the time that, for the situation that you're in, I appreciate the, the hard work it takes to take care of that. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, Bastrop County Long-Term Recovery, Ms. Lowe. Good to see you, Sheila. Hi. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Council, and City Manager. Thank you all for having me here this evening on behalf um, of the Bastrop County Long-Term Recovery Team. So 2020 and 2021 has been quite um, different for a long-term recovery disaster organization. You would not think that we would be participating in a public health crisis, but we did. 
And um, we, um, with other partners that are in this room, were able to step up and help our community uh, quite well, if I may say so myself. We did a great job, and um, I appreciate the, um, the opportunities that we've been given to assist with helping the city of Bastrop respond to some of those needs as well. Um, so recently, we wrapped up our winter storm assistance along with our COVID-19 um, financial assistance to families, with the exception of our COVID-19 mortgage assistance that just started last month um, that's going to be able to help Bastrop County households that have 80% um, or are at 80% or less of the area medium income. We're going to be able to help them with six months of mortgage assistance with only one of those months having to be current or uh, a future payment. So that's gonna be a, a big help to some of our um, residents here in the county that have, have suffered. Um, since last year, this time, um, we served as Bastrop County's hotline for COVID-19, and we took over a little over 4,200 calls in uh, from March 2020 to 20, uh, March 2021. 454 of those calls from were from inside the uh, the city limits. So those calls, we we tracked each one from the air, different areas in the county. So we took about 454 from the city of Bastrop. And during this grant period, we took in 228. We didn't really keep track of the calls that we got for vaccines because that was being handled by another organization. So we were just trying to get people uh, routed to where they needed to be. Um, during um, last year, um, we were able to do some great things with the partners that we had. One of them was to make sure that our seniors were not going out into public places when they didn't need to. We were able to partner with Combined Community Action in their Meals on Wheels program and provide deliveries for those families, so to assist with the volunteers there. And then also with the Bastrop County Emergency Food Pantry, when we had seniors that called in on the hotline that needed food, we were able to hook them up with the uh, food pantry and they got them the meals or the groceries and we provided the volunteers for that. Um, for our primary purpose and what we ended up doing is because this is different for the long-term recovery team, we ended up changing our mission to include assistance with public health. Um, so I'm gonna break it down real quick with these numbers. We were able for winter storm, we assisted 32 families with household repairs, whether it was plumbing, leaks, roof repairs within the city of Bastrop. Um, we also helped 21 families during the winter storm with utility assistance. That was seven with utility assistance, uh, nine with home and plumbing repairs, and five with rental assistance. And we even had one family that we assisted with pending Harvey repairs. So we, we, we kind of reached back for that. Um, and then, as I stated, we are doing the mortgage assistance program, and by our numbers working with CAPCOG, we're probably going to have 15% of those are going to be coming from the city of Bastrop, and I'll report on that as well. If I can take a minute real quick, just to remind you all that this is the 10-year anniversary of the Bastrop County Complex fires. September 4th, we're going to be at the Bastrop Convention Center. It's a community event, and we're asking everyone to come out and to uh, support the families that were affected and to also reflect on our resiliency and the county. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Sheila. I, uh, Sheila and I were talking daily during COVID because I would read the call center and we would be sharing information to make sure we could get folks the answer. And at a really stressful time, you and your volunteers provided some clarity and assurance, and I just really appreciate the extra efforts with and that. And lots of, lots of answers about when the dog park was going to open back up. Yes, ma'am. That was, that, was, that was a high point for me last year. Okay, Bastrop County first responders. Scooter, I saw you back there. Mr. Green. Uh, my name is James Green. I go by Scooter. I'm with Bastrop County First Responders. We're a registered first responder organization with the Department of State Health Services that works in conjunction with county contracted EMS provider. And a lot of times we respond along with them and often get there before they get and we initiate patient care. Uh, we've been providing service to the citizens of Bastrop and uh, the city of Bastrop as well as the county since 1988. 
and historically we do about 2,000 responses a year. Uh, again, like most organizations, 2020's numbers are a little bit <laughs> off kilter. Um, and uh, we respond to emergency incidents uh, within the city as well as the county with our volunteers. And we also work with in conjunction with the Bastrop Fire Department, providing an umbrella organization for them to operate uh, their medical standby or their medical first response as well. Additionally, we do medical standbys um, here in the city and around the county. Most notably recently, the uh, summer in the city, uh, we participated and provided medical standby services uh, as well as the Patriotic Festival and homecoming and rodeos and all that other stuff. Additionally, we provide a very low cost EMT training uh, option uh, that we do classes. Typically, we do about two classes a year uh, and graduate in the neighborhood of about 25 students uh, that go on to work and volunteer with our organization here. Um, historically, in 2018, we received funding from this particular program uh, that purchased some AEDs and radios. Um, in 2020, we obtained our mobile medical unit, which uh, it took a, we got it in service uh, right as COVID went into play and it got deployed out at Mayfest Park for four months and operated our COVID testing site. Uh, so it was a, a fantastic use and return on investment there. Uh, let the operations continue out there for that prolonged period of time. Uh, and, and last year we obtained, uh, we used the funding to purchase some AEDs. This year's needs assessment, we've determined that we need to replace uh, a direct replacement of five broken radios that, that are uh, still in our possession that are greater than 12 years old and are no longer supported uh, by Motorola. Um, and we've got a little bit of a special this year. We're getting $400 of a buyback program that's a special uh, right now that we're going to take advantage of. So that funding would come to $17,277.10. And this is a multi-year capital type acquisition, not a, just an operational expense. Any questions? Really appreciate all the good work that you guys do. Thanks, Scooter. Scooter's one of those people that you really hope you don't ever need him, but when you need him, you are really glad to see him. Bastrop County Emergency Food Pantry. There she is. Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Taylor Andre. I'm the program manager at the Bastrop County Emergency Food Pantry, and I'm presenting on behalf of our executive director, Ms. Tricia Silva. Um, so the mission of the Bastrop County Emergency Food Pantry is to serve Bastrop County residents going through periods of transition by providing emergency food assistance, education, and support. We're able to meet this mission by providing programs such as our emergency food assistance program, our brown bag program, our open arms program, nibbles, and we are in phase one of transitioning back to be able to provide educational workshops, financial classes, and our fresh food for families program. Um, all the funds requested would be to help support these programs. Um, I would like to share with you just a few of our many um, accomplishments um, during the pandemic of last year. Um, so just through our emergency assistance program alone, the pantry was able to serve 2,761 individuals, distributing a total of 174,455 pounds of food. Um, with the partnership with Bastrop County Long-Term Recovery Team, we were able to work with volunteers to also provide 140 seniors who were either told by their physicians to stay home or who just were um, terrified of going out, which is completely understandable. But we were able to provide those individuals with fresh produce, whole grains, water, and non-perishable items. Um, we were also able to expand our Nibbles program during that time and have included Emil Elementary now to our list that we're serving, bringing our total to serving 168 students last year and providing them with over um, 23,960 pounds of food. Um, in the past, Central Texas Food Bank that we partner with as well has recognized our executive director, Ms. Tricia Silva, and our organization um, as the Central Food Pantry Partner of the Year for our innovative approach of being a hunger buster in the community. Well, last year they presented her with the Hunger Heroes Award for all the hard work that was put forth during the pandemic. Um, so here at BCFP, we believe that it's so important to go above and beyond than just simply handing out food. We like to address the issues that bring the residents to our door by providing them with resources, information, and referrals, and kind of bridging the gap between the services. Um, with that, we use a model that, is, that has a holistic approach in serving our clients, and we truly appreciate all of your support in order to help us continue to do the work that we've done. 
Um, we are very grateful to have been able to be of service to the community since 1987 and truly grateful for your support. It's very critical to keeping our doors open and keeping our pantry shelves stocked. Thank you. Great job. We'll tell Tricia you did a great job. Thank you. Okay. Council, you'll remember that um, often our city staffs helps with the Nibbles program and stuff in those backpacks so that the kids that have food insecurity ha are able to have meals on the weekends. That's the Nibbles program. All right, Bastrop County Child Welfare Board. Hi, Judge. Hello. Um, we're requesting the same amount as last year, uh, but the need has actually gone up a whole lot. So let me just sort of explain the contradiction there, apparently. Uh, last year, um, it's always kind of confusing to talk about fiscal year versus calendar year. So we are in our second year calendar, uh, fiscal year of funding from the city council. Uh, the first year, we spent uh, $2,155 on 15 children who were removed from within the city limits. Uh, most of the kids that we help are removed from within the city limits. Some of them are also placed within the city limits, but that's kind of a rarity. And actually, I should stop for just a second and just say that what we do is uh, provide help to families who are starting out with foster kids uh, for startup needs. The state does not uh, provide these kinds of things. So when a, when a child is removed from a home and is placed with a, uh, with a family, there are lots of initial expenses, some of which um, are, are not common, but some of which are very common. Like for instance, if a child is removed too quickly and they can't grab a lot of clothes, they have to just get some clothes to get going. If there is not a bed there, uh, the, the bed has to be provided or bedding has to be provided. So uh, we kind of fit within a network of support organizations, some of which you've already heard from tonight, CASA, um, the Child Advocacy Center, those are groups that serve some of these same kids. What we do is we provide startup funds for kids who are removed and placed with a relative, which is called kinship care. So we don't provide funds to foster kids, we provide funds to kinship care kids, um, and that's, like I said, with a relative, and the, either the relatives have to dip into their own pockets and to pay for this, or they come to us and ask for help. And so uh, that's the role that we play. It's an organization that's created by the commissioner's court, so we're quasi-governmental. We're not nonprofit. Um, all the people on Child Welfare Board are appointed by the Commissioner's Court. So having said all that, um, this past fiscal year, the one that we're in right now, uh, through three quarters, we have served 22 kids versus 15 the prior complete year at $3,700. So we've actually spent not quite twice as much money this fiscal year for three calendar quarter, three, for three quarters as we did all of last year. So the need has clearly gone up, and I can explain why that is in a second, but let me tell you why we're not asking for more money than we did last year, besides the fact that the mayor counseled us to take that approach. Um, we have actually had quite a lot of fundraising uh, in the last 12 months. I'm not quite sure how to explain it. Uh, our private funding from people who want to contribute has actually gone up during the pandemic, go figure. Uh, so we're actually in better shape than we thought we would be uh, at this time last year because our private funding has been going down sort of steadily. So the pandemic has kind of given us new life. Um, we are going to be uh, looking at this amount of money uh, for, for the next uh, year and we feel like uh, it's gonna meet the need that is driving this increase in, in, in Bastrop and elsewhere and I'll just tell you what that is very quickly. As you heard tonight, um, there's a crisis going on with CPS, kids are sleeping in the offices, and, and the foster care system uh, is focusing more and more on placing kids with relatives. So kinship care is becoming a much bigger priority than it has been in the past, which means there are more kids needing startup funds. So that's the reason why this is happening. Okay, any questions? How much does the commissioner's court give you? 3,500, and we've gotten funding from Smithville, uh, we've gotten funding some, from some uh, nonprofit organizations that fund uh, this, these kinds of groups, like, for instance, Born Again Emporium. Uh, since I got on the Child Welfare Board, our, fun, our funding from sort of reliable sources like you all uh, has really gone up. So we're, we're actually in better financial shape than we've ever been. Um, and that's partly because you've helped us and because Smithville is helping us. Uh, the one holdout so far is Elgin, but we're keeping our fingers crossed that maybe this year that'll be different. Um, 
but uh, certainly the level of support that you provided to us is more than commensurate with the need here in Bastrop. And unfortunately, that's probably just going to get worse because of what I just said. More and more kids are getting placed with uh, relatives. Thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate that. Okay. And good news for everyone, the last organization, Austin Habitat for Humanity. Good to see you. All right. Yeah. Great to see you all in person again after a long time. Some familiar faces and some new ones. And thank you for the opportunity to come down here and speak. So, um, I represent the Austin Habitat for Humanity Home Repair Program. In addition to creating new home ownership and uh, some of the development we've done here in your city, we also act to preserve existing homeowners. And we do that by doing construction, triage, or major life and safety. Um, accessibility, code compliance, and things if left untreated would give rise to a hazard or cause the structure to continue to deteriorate. Um, last year, we were able to serve a family who uh, lives here in the Central City area after being displaced themselves by the Bastrop Complex. And we were able to bolster the funding that we received from the City of Bastrop by $3,000 and um, replacing a very leaky, uh, heat inefficient uh, 28 square roof and doing an accessibility modification to the owner converting a uh, tub to a shower with grab bars and stability features uh, so that they can age in place. And in addition, we returned after uh, some freeze issues uh, to do some plumbing on that house with uh, independent funds of Austin Habitat for Humanity. I'll just illustrate something that we do with uh, any funds that we're stewards of is we provide wraparound services, uh, partnering with either other resources, creating referrals uh, to get additional assistance that may be beyond our scope of practice, uh, such as the food bank, adult protective services, and whatever the case may be, uh, or um, groups like Combined Community Action for Weatherization. Uh, we also will use volunteers to come out and put some icing on the cake, re uh, replace some siding, uh, paint the house, and uh, we've done that uh, for some Bastrop um, community fun funding recipients um, here in your city. So uh, we really appreciate the opportunity um, to, to ask for these funds again, and we strive to be ser serve your uh, community again in 2022. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate all of the organizations that came, and I know you have already worked a really long day, and you are going to hurt no one's feelings if you guys leave. So have a wonderful, safe evening, and we appreciate both the application, and um, we have a community support meeting this week, so I know I'll be visiting with you guys later on. Council, are you doing okay? Oh, we need a... Uh, bio break. It is 747 and we're going to take a really quick, really quick recess and we will come back and start on item 13D. We are in recess at 7. Okay, we're going to get started again. It is 752 and we are back in session. We are on item 13D, hold public hearing and consider action. You guys okay? Yes. Okay. Hold public hearing and consider action to approve resolution number R-2021-65 of the Council of the City of Bastrop, Texas, approving a development agreement between the City of Bastrop, a home rule city, and Continental Homes of Texas, LP, a Texas limited partnership for 399.9 plus or minus acres of land out of the Nancy Blakey Survey Abstract 98 to the west of FM 969. Located within the City of Bastrop extraterritorial jurisdiction is attached in Exhibit A. Author authorizing the city manager to execute all necessary documents, providing for repealing cause, and establishing an effective date. So Ms. Bills is going to make a presentation, and then we will open the, op we will open the public hearing. And I have, and uh, Madam Secretary, I think you gave me two 16s. So I think we're, we go to 18. So we have 18 people signed up to speak, and I will be calling you in the order that you signed up. Ms. Bills. Good evening. So today we're here to talk about a development agreement um, on this tract as, as shown in the slide. Uh, it's uh, 
a little under a 400 acre tract just south of the colony, west of FM 969. Uh, this has previously come before city council. Um, it came back in December um, under the name New Communities with one kind of a development concept. Um, since then it's come back in March uh, for a, a public improvement district creation. And at this point, all we've done is create that boundary, which is this is the boundary that you see for the, um, for the PID district. So just a kind of a summary of the area. So the applicant in this case is Continental Homes of Texas. Uh, the area is located within our statutory ETJ. That's the one mile ETJ around the city limits. And on our future land use plan, it has this area designated as neighborhood residential. So what we're here to talk about tonight is the development agreement. So this development agreement, since it's in our ATJ, and one of the things, the, the, probably the biggest consideration is the utility agreement that within this development agreement. Uh, this, is, uh, this area is within the Bastrop Wastewater CCN, so this is the area that the city can serve wastewater to. Um, we have obviously a new wastewater treatment plant going in south of this, um, so this would be an ideal customer for the city. Um, it is in the Aqua Water CCN, but the city several years ago executed an agreement with Aqua that as long as we're serving a sewer to uh, a development, we are able to be either a wholesale or, in this case, a retail water provider for the development. So that is uh, something we're, that's in our agreement that we will be the water provider through Aqua. Uh, one of the other considerations in here is that the city has requested the option to annex this property into the city limits at a point uh, which uh, after final, the final plot has been recorded at a time that it's financially feasible for the city. So when it's in the city's best interest to annex that in after the final plot has been recorded. And uh, the other big thing is this is establishes development standards that are based on the B3 codes. Um, there are, is no zoning on this property because it's in the ETJ. So this, these development standards say what the process will be, what standards they'll be reviewed under until which time they're annexed into the city. So this before you is the concept plan. So this is one of the exhibits in the agreement. It's exhibit F. Uh, this shows a layout of their parks and open space, their uh, single, what they're calling single family, and then their core commercial district. And they patterned these uh, development types, is what they call them, after our B3 code place types. So the, the, they kind of equate to our P1, P3, and P5 districts and use a lot of the same standards. So one of the things you'll also see is the road network throughout here. So in our ETJ, one of our um, main requirements in the ETJ is that you follow our 720 block grid, which is our farm lot grid. Um, what the, this development has done is they keep that grid for, you can see along the main, ah, me and the clicker don't always get along. Okay. Clicker is not like me tonight. But you can see along the southern boundary of the property, that is going to be the future extension of Blakey Lane. So that is, uh, they're responsible for the construction of half of that road. And you can see that they've provided uh, the distances between those road connections at roughly a, a 700 block length. So they'll have those main connections to the, the main thoroughfares. And then within the subdivision, they'll be following uh, the block structure is uh, smaller than our, the farm lots, but a little, little bigger than the building blocks. But there are ca cases where you can see they have a lot of connectivity for pedestrians into the, all those parks and open space. And one of the other things that has t some discussion, in our master thoroughfare plan, uh, we showed a major, uh, or a multimodal street is what we call it on our uh, thoroughfare plan, coming through and connecting to Woodlands Drive. With this plan, you see that major multimodal road coming in and actually going south into what would have been, uh, that used to be called FM20, it's just a, it's a connector road from 71 on our uh, master transportation plan. And then they have a, a larger uh, road through the development that you can see comes, clicker still, oh, so close. Uh, that, that circles around and then comes back down and connects into Blakey Lane. So that major, that major road uh, is throughout, throughout the development, but the uh, connection to Woodlands Drive is actually a local residential connection street. It's not one of the major connections. Uh, so recognizing that Woodlands Drive is a residential street, it connects to a residential street and not a main thoroughfare. 
So just kind of a breakdown of their land uses as they are in the development agreement. They have uh, 87, almost 88 acres of parks and open space. Uh, they have 200 and uh, almost 65 acres of single family. Uh, they'll have 12.4 acres of core, which is a commercial up at the front uh, towards 969 for a total. And then the, uh, they'll have 35 acres that get dedicated as right of ways. So within the development standards, um, this since this ad is developing within the ETJ, um, the development standards, as I said, they f they mirror our codes um, with the 720 block grid, and really meeting those intents of our code to be uh, multimodal, pedestrian friendly, and to uh, also recognize the geography of the area. This area has several um, floodplains and uh, waterways that cut through the property. And you'll see that on the concept plan that they've uh, worked those uh, areas into the concept plan to be parks and open space to deal with that drainage uh, and make uh, a series of parks throughout the, the neighborhood that also take into account the geography. So some of the blocks do break up because of those uh, geographic challenges. Um, one of the other goals is they're uh, doing uh, wooded strips along the roads to make this is a very wooded property, so they're wanting to preserve as many trees as they can and gonna work that into their um, public improvement plans. So in the posted packet, there was a slight change in the, uh, the draft that um, we have tonight. It's the, the, we had some random highlights in the, you'll probably see in the development standards, uh, those were removed and then there was one line that was big yellow highlight that still needed a, a tweak on wording and it was, a revolving around when you don't have to do a site plan, and this uh, mirrors our code, that you don't have to do a site plan, a formal site plan, when it's uh, exempt in our international residential code. So that's the only thing that changed uh, from the version in your packet. Uh, so at the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting at the end of May, there were three speakers at the meeting. Um, all three were against, um, and they stated, Concerns, uh, a lot of concerns about drainage was a main concern, uh, the connectivity to Woodland Drive, and then also just disturbing the natural environment that, that's in that area. Um, also, uh, before PNZ and then since, we've received a total of two um, comments for, 10 against, and two that just requested more information. Um, so at, at the PNZ meeting, we did talk about those concerns about drainage that this will be reviewed under the city's stormwater drainage manual. We all, um, you'll see on our next steps all the different plans we get to review. Uh, the connectivity to, Wood to Woodlands Drive, we think that we've, you know, connectivity is a big concern in and out of the city limits. Um, so that connection is needed, but we are cognizant of making sure that's a, a neighborhood connection. And then disturbing the environment, the developers with, uh, the street grid are trying to recognize the, the geography and the, the existing trees within the development. So at PNZ, the commission voted six to one to recommend approval of the concept plan. The concept plan is the main thing they looked at because that's kind of their purview. They look at land use, they look at subdivision regs, and these are things that will come back to them in the future. Uh, one of the things at PNZ that's different between that meeting and this meeting, originally, uh, you can see in the concept plan, kind of a bigger tract off to the west there. Uh, they'd originally call that an innovation tract, and we're uh, still still kind of in the works to possibly do something with uh, the original new communities project. That since then they have taken that out, so all of this area is within the agreement, and we'll be following the development standards uh, that are established in this development agreement. Oh, going too far. Going the wrong direction. So next steps, um, and this was in the, the report, but it was listed wrong. So what's coming back at the next meeting is the PID uh, financing agreement. So this is one of the steps in, we've established the PID boundaries. The next is establishing the PID financing agreement. So that'll come on uh, July 27th, and then add a date to be determined. The next step is the service and assessment plan. So you see that a lot with Hunter's Crossing. These are the different steps. So that's the service and assessment plan is that what actually determines um, the amount of money that will be able to be uh, bonded for the project. 
and that's something that uh, we've already we've been reviewing the PID financing agreement with our consultants. Um, they think that looks good. Their in their recommendation is that the city actually write the service and assessment plan. So we will discuss that at the next meeting. Development process wise, so right now we have um, some public improvement plans that we're reviewing um, for the major tract improvements, which are mainly wastewater improvements, because they're trying to, that's that's kind of the big, big lead time thing for a development um, of this size, especially, is getting those uh, major wastewater improvements uh, to connect into our system. So they're working on that now, that's under review. The next step um, for their first section uh, is gonna be a preliminary drainage plan, preliminary infrastructure plan, then the preliminary plat, which will come back before P and Z. And then they'll have the final drainage plans, public improvement plans, the public improvement plan agreement that will come back to city council, and then the final plat that goes back to PNZ after that. Uh, so that's kind of the steps. And then for any of the commercial development or anything that's not covered in the International Residential Code, we'll have site development plans, and then everything will go through our permitting process. So everything in this development will go through the building permit process. Any questions? Thank you, Ms. Bills. Good overview. Council, any questions for Ms. And the developer is here if you have questions of them as well. Okay. Uh, Ms. Bills, I did, in part of the exhibits, I just, uh, I wanted to make sure I'm real clear on this. Any place, if you go back, probably the concept plan is where we're going to spend a lot of time. <laughs> where there's a 60-foot right-of-way, I'm, I'm um, given, Ms. Councilmember Crouch is going to be interested in this. I see that there are two bike lanes as a part of this street cross-section. Yes. And that, um, since that is a part of the planning section, they are committing that that's what they're going to do yes. within a 60 foot that's right That's their away. cross section that's being adopted as their development standard. Okay. And then what they're calling an avenue street that has an 80 foot right away has a 10 foot sidewalk on one side. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the 80 foot is that big one that comes in off 969 and then curves down back towards 71. And then the 60 foot um, one with the bike lanes is kind of the loop part in the middle and then also comes then back around, uh, back down to Blakey Lane. So the bigger streets that connect all the different neighborhoods. Okay, and then the other thing that I wanted to make sure everybody was real clear that we're all reading the concept plan the same way is the highlighted and the, the solid white lines within the PID boundaries, those are streets, this is a concept plan so it's not a final plat, but those are streets that will be built by the developer. Yes. And the streets that connect to that that are have dashed gray around them, those are streets that will be developed when that property is developed. Yes. And um, I had a conversation with someone and I wanted to make sure we were real clear for the public because you've used an aerial view, a satellite view for um, a considerable portion that surrounds it, mm -hmm. but you did not use the aerial view to the north. And it is my understanding that those are final plats. Yes. And so where there is a dashed line coming down out of the final plat from the north, which I believe is a portion of the colony, mm -hmm. the reason that this concept plan is lining up is because those streets will exist. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to make sure from a plat to plat survey standpoint, there's connection for the system. Although this doesn't look like a standard grid system, this is compliant with our transportation plan and it's the point of making sure that we're not building streets that don't line up with things that we have already committed to. Yes. Is yes. that, am I yeah. on the right so page? The, so the, the area to the north um, within the white area, those are, those are street alignments that we already know because they are in a plat that we've uh, either have under review or have already recorded. I will say some of the, the dashed lines that go off to the side uh, we don't have those plats yet, but those are there. That north-south road is not in the colonies agreement. Um, so again, this is a concept plan. So some of these lines may change, especially then and then some of the dash lines to the south. Uh, those are kind of perspective based off of our master transportation plan. Um, but those alignments could change given de development situations and road connections with TxDOT and things like that. So right, but with the intersection of 20 and 71. That, to your point, if TxDOT mm -hmm. does some improvements to that intersection, it may adjust a little yeah. bit, but they're likely to not pick up 20 and put it substantially yes, exactly, distant. Yeah. And then it seems to the far west that we're connecting at a median break. Again, yeah. knowing that that could potentially be a light, a lighted mm -hmm. signal or something at some point. Yeah. So I, the developers kind of used their best the knowledge they had today of creating a, a grid 
But again, they can only control what's inside their development. So. And the connection point at 969, what does that align to to the east of 969? Uh, that aligns to? Is that, isn't that? Doesn't, I don't think there's anything there yet. So that is a concept plan, but they pretty much picked the center of yeah, their property. Yeah, because Blakey Lane is what is to the south. Okay. Yeah, and there may be a driveway that it lines up with, but and, and I will say that connection is going to go through TxDOT to determine that exact. That exact location. That exact location. They'll get some assistance from TxDOT yeah. on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Council, any questions for Ms. Bills? As she mentioned, the applicants here, do you have any questions for the applicant? Mayor Pro Tem Nelson, you um, had made an inquiry that I want to review. Uh, Mr. Borquez, the, it is our understanding that your office has reviewed the development agreement that is in our packet. That's correct, Mayor. Okay. All right. We are going to, I am officially opening the public hearing. We have 18 people signed up to speak. I will call you in the order that you have signed up. I would like for you, um, what we do when we have our public hearing is you're going to state your name, your address, and then my trusty timekeeper is going to give you three minutes to address council, and we would encourage you to be respectful of um, each other's time. All right, the first person that we have signed up to speak, I'm pretty sure, yes, wish to speak, is Sherry Gaines Taylor. Is Miss Taylor here? All right, we're going to move on. If she comes in, will um, somebody let me know. Next person signed up to speak is Brandon and Jessica Camp. Mr. Camp? Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Brandon Camp. The address is 246 Woodlands Drive. Appreciate it, Mayor, City Manager, and Council. Um, we're probably the newest residents to the street in Woodlands and uh, moving in on November. We pride ourselves on being strong advocates for the state of Texas. My wife and I both work for Department of Family Protective Services. Um, <clears throat> we're active members with the Texas Wildlife Association. And this development plan <clears throat> is kind of uh, what's, what's causing a uh, a conundrum in our, in our minds, uh, we, we had this idea moving from Tahitian Village over to Woodlands to create our forever home. And uh, we were trying to create our own American dream by having this bit of land and preserving the area around it, being strong advocates following Leopold and wildlife conservation. We feel that this creates strong uh, oppositions for wildlife in the area, as well as just natural enjoyment for any of the residents in the area. So I would like to state that we oppose uh, this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Camp. All right, the next person signed up to speak is Frank, and I believe it's Guerrero. And I apologize in advance if I don't say your name correctly. I promise I'm, I'm doing the very best I can. Good evening. I'm Frank Guerrero, 306 Woodlands Drive. And first of all, I oppose to them opening up Woodlands Drive. Y'all would have to do upgrades. The road is not maintained for the kind of traffic that would amount from this new subdivision. Uh, you would need to upgrade the culverts and drainage. You would have to buy it right away. Uh, you're affecting the lives of the children that are walking up and down the street and ride bikes. We have a country setting. Opening up, you would bring in more crime that we don't, we don't have any problem with now. So that's why I oppose. Thank you, Mr. Thank Greer. You. And the next person is, I believe this is Sal Armstrong. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. I appreciate it. I vehemently oppose this and that uh, proposed annex annexation of a uh, woodland subdivision and in coming into the city. Uh, we do not want a through street. I've been in the woodlands probably longer than anybody out there, 27 years. 
I bought the property because we had a one way in, turn around and go back out. It's been peaceful, it's been calm. Like the gentleman said, we have lots of wildlife. Every day, my wife and I take a drive just to count the deer in our neighborhood. When we left the home, there was a fawn and two does in our front yard. You put that much traffic coming down that road, you're gonna destroy that. We already have some that get hit by automobiles simply because of that. We have children walking and playing on the streets because it is safe. We do not have any crime. We watch out for each other. We take care of each other. And we're not gonna allow, or we don't want to allow, an opportunity for a big corporation to come in and put in a through street to connect entire subdivision to somewhere else. When we bought it, our bylaw stated that it was a closed street. That's why we bought. That's why we live there. We love the property. We take care of it. So again, I vehemently oppose any through street. I vehemently oppose any possibility of annexation. Our taxes will go up. Many of us are older people on fixed income. We barely can pay the taxes now. And you're gonna cost people, you think you got homeless now, you're gonna cost some more because people can't afford the taxes. And um, I don't know what else to say except for the fact I love my neighbors, we look out for each other, we respect each other, and we want to be our community. We love Bastrop, we love Bastrop County. We wouldn't live here if we did not. And I support what they want to do with their subdivision, that's fine. That's their subdivision. Let them take care of their subdivision. Don't try to take us in and say we need to have a through street just so they can get in and out of their place. We don't want that. We don't need that. So thank you very much, I appreciate your time, and please seriously listen to our residents because we do not want a through street, we do not want to be part of Bastrop City per se. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Armstrong. We, d we need to maintain professional decorum, so we're not, we don't clap and we don't boo, we're, we're just having our meeting. I do wanna have a clarification of something because I feel like there's something that is misunderstood and Mr. Borquez, I would ask you to confirm this. The annexation is for the Viridian project only and it would only be within the PID boundary, is that correct? Yes, Mayor, that's correct. The annexation of this property upon request of the property owner does not affect anybody else's status in the ATJ. So it, the Woodlands is not going to be annexed. That is not, that cannot happen. And we've got some assistance from our friends under the big dome, granite dome in Austin. The city does not have the ability to annex like they've done in the past. So the only annexation that we are able to do is voluntary annexation. So I, I just wanna clarify that even if this project moves forward, you, it does not trigger any sort of annexation for the Woodlands. All right, the next person that signed up to speak was Janie Armstrong. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Armstrong. Thank you. Pablo Martinez. Okay, thank you. Couldn't tell that by this. All right. Um, Isabella Stewart? Good evening. My Good name evening. is Isabella Lucchese Stewart. Uh, thank you, Mayor and council, City Council members for the time tonight. I own property at 160 FM 969, which is exactly in front of Lakey Road and the back of my property is where Highway 20 comes. So with this development, you are truly cutting my property into four parts. And I would have to get rid of my business. I have 33 
base for RV parks that are full and to extend Blakey Road, all those 33 bays would disappear. All the picket fences, all the front yards with grass, everything would be gone. Now, I understand development and I understand, understand growth, but I don't understand the property needing to go through mine for two major roads and no one contacting me. There was a gentleman who contacted me in September with the developers, in November too, and in January. And I have made 11 phone calls. None of them have been answered. This is my business. It will be affected majorly. I own 25 acres. I've, I have been approved to have 91 bays, and I didn't want to do an RV park that was crowded. Each bay has a yard for kids to play in. They have picket fences on both sides. They have trees. And out of the 25 acres, I'm keeping 15 acres because I do know there is a lot of wildlife. We have a, a seven and eight pointer, and I told residents, if you get them, you're out of here. That's for everyone to enjoy. We have a pond with large mouth bass that is catch and release. We don't want to affect all that. That's why we're developing less than half of the, I'm developing less than half of the 25 acres. But why is this happening, uh, a development of this magnitude that would have to cut through my property at two places? If you look at that development, look at the bottom side where Blakey Road is coming through, and then 20, that is a cross. That property you're looking at is my property. Why is the development? Why are things being voted on? And I will be majorly affected, and no one has taken the time to talk to me, to tell me, because I will lose the 33 spots I have. You cannot expand Blakey. It's only 100 feet wide for 13 1,350 uh, uh, feet, that's where the 33 bays are, One, almost a little over a mile, but they're only 100 feet wide. The road would have to do away with all of my business. Why can this happen with no one telling me, no one answering phone calls? Now, thank goodness, thank you, thank goodness that the city of Bastrop sends letters, otherwise I'd be in the dark. So thank you for your time. I'm opposed that the way this is happening with someone who will be affected greatly without being told. Thank you all for your time tonight. Thank you very much. All right. Raquel Fott? Am I saying it right? Oh, she does not wish to speak, but she is opposed. I'm sorry, I'm supposed to read the whole card. Sorry about that. Um, Joey, and say your last names for me. Nagada. I just call you Joey, so Nagada. Yeah. And you are um, up next to speak. Hello, I'm, I'm Joey Nahida. I'm with uh, Hunt Communities. We're the developer of the colony, the, the property to the north of uh, this property we're talking about. And I'm really only talking about one specific uh, piece of the development agreement, and it's the connectivity. Um, which, thank you, you and Ms. Bills for talking about, that uh, the connectivity coming in to, uh, or going north into the colony, that it's um, preliminary. And it's, um, so, so I do understand that, but I just do want to say that we are opposed to that western, uh, westernmost connectivity coming into uh, the colony. Uh, it's, I, I, and I'd also like just to, to make it known that there is a tri, uh, tri-party agreement that um, has already been approved for connectivity uh, going into the colony. Um, and that area to the, to the west, has, it, it's already been preliminary platted. And construction is, is already underway without that connectivity coming uh, into the development. Um, so I just wanted to, to state that. Um, and for those reasons, we're, we're opposed to it, but um, other than that, you know, we, we want to be a good neighbor to uh, D.R. Horton and 
the, the, the property to our south, the, our south and um, do what we can to help out the city of Bastrop in any way we can. Thank you. Does, any questions for me? Yes, ma'am. I, I guess, sir, I have one question for Jennifer. Is there, is there a preliminary plat that we're not showing on that? Is that platted? There's, there's a preliminary plat there. Um, I think at the time we had this, we didn't have that information that when okay. this started. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Council, any questions? Okay. All right. I'm reading the whole thing. All right. Uh, Justin Fawn. Evening. Uh, my name is Justin Fawn. I live at 432 Woodlands Drive, which if you look at the map, um, the uh, most northern property touching this new development, that's my property. Um, and so my first concern is drainage. They show single family developments um, touching my property. If you looked at the plans they submitted, that shows a 10 foot setback um, from the residential structure to that property line or to my property. Um, I'm not sure how the drainage uh, issues or plans they've showed address that since there would be, it doesn't show any drainage, it just shows properties abutting up to my property with, with a 10 foot setback. The property's not flat. There's a creek that goes through the back of my property that would be affected. Um, I don't see how these plans address that. Um, second, I do have an issue with the transportation, with the roads that they are proposing here. Um, first of all, they show a road connecting to Woodlands Drive, which is never intended to be a thoroughfare. As they said, that's a residential street. However, like most country residential streets, there are no sidewalks. As Mr. Armstrong pointed out, we have, I think, 88 homes in our neighborhood. Many of those have children. They have people walking pets. We don't have sidewalks. We have a, a country lane. And so people are constantly walking on there, our kids riding bikes, pets are you know, walking with their owners, plus the wildlife. Woodlands Drive connects to 71, um, right at 21, as if 21 were to have gone through 71. Um, we've seen additional traffic since that light's been put in to the point that at some point, 71 gets backed up onto 71 from the exit to R Street and Highway 21. With the roads that they're showing as the as the colony person pointed out, their, their roads are not gonna be connected to this new subdivision. They have a private uh, subdivision and I don't believe they intend their roads to connect to there. The roads that are going south are proposed and those, they show two going directly from 71 into that subdivision. If you look at the westernmost road connected to this new development plan, the, the easiest route from there on 71 would be to go through on Woodlands Drive, which they've addressed showing that it's a smaller road going to Woodlands Drive, but that's the fastest connection point from 71 back to 71. We've all been stuck in traffic on 71 from an accident many times at that intersection on 21 near the colony. The first thing that people try and do is get off of 71 and find the quickest route out of that accident, out of, out of that uh, situation that they're in. From their plans, that quickest route will be through our subdivision, which is not able to accommodate that type of traffic. It's not made for that. It's a danger to everyone living in our subdivision. Second, if, if the 71 roads aren't developed now, the only road going from Highway 969 to 71 would be our connecting street, which once again, they've said is a residential street. We have no sidewalks. It's a community, it's a subdivision, and it's not, it cannot accommodate that type of traffic. I don't understand why their subdivision needs to join to ours. They clearly show that they have a route going to 969. They're proposing roads going to 71. The only benefit to that subdivision of joining to ours would be a direct route to 71 and that 21 intersection. In my viewing of these plans and what they presented today, it seems that it's incomplete. I don't see how the 
council can approve incomplete plans for it to move forward with all these questions. They, in the plans, they talk about addressing these, these transportation issues with TxDOT, with the City Transportation Commission. I don't see that that's been done. If, if these are the plans that they're submitting. There are many more questions that it brings up than answers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fawn. Robert Meyer. My name, <coughs> excuse me. My name is Robert Meyer. I reside at 116 Timber Court, which is just a cul-de-sac off of Woodlands Drive. I've been there for about a year. And uh, as previous, uh, speakers have talked about is a great place to live uh, from especially from the standpoint you feel like you're in the country there's not very much traffic uh, there only the residents there with the traffic therefore it allows lots of folks to walk on the side of the road children can ride their bikes there my concern and my objection to this is the connectivity issue, which you've already heard quite a bit about. I also wonder, uh, as I look at this, many of the, the plan are concepts. They're not really finalized there. Do we really know uh, what will, uh, where the uh, traffic will be able to get out of, of that, uh, of that subdi subdivision? Probably until they all get developed, a lot of that new traffic is going to come down Woodlands Drive. And if for those of the, the, you that may or may not be acquainted with Woodlands Drive, it was built only as a residential street. Now, over time, at best, it's a poor residential street. The sides of the roads need a lot of work. They're falling off there. So people are walking on the sides of the roads. My concern is with an increase of traffic, which if we, as I understand, there's gonna be 1,600 different uh, residences in there or places. Well, if we, that's probably with people in households today have two cars, maybe one, but we're gonna be adding 2,500 to 3,000 cars down there. They've either gotta go right or they're gonna to come to Woodlands Drive. What is the impact? Have we even done a study of, on that road? It's easy to connect to it, but we own the problem. We own the problem there and a lot of unanswered questions there at this point. So we own that problem and, uh, and to me it's a safety issue also too. Safety for not only the people that wanna live there and walk along there, but with that condition of that road it's a safety issue uh, for folks that would be coming out of the subdivision there. So I hope you will find that we shouldn't move along here too, too hastily on this. It has a lot, of imp uh, a lot of problems. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. The next person is John Poynier. I could go for Payne, I could go for Poynier, 500 West Bend White Boulevard. The John part I'm really clear about. <laughs> Anybody? Okay. Christopher Gung Gungaware? How close? Yes. All right. Tell us your name and address. Christopher, yeah, yes, ma'am. Christopher Gungaware at 235 Woodlands Drive. I uh, appreciate you uh, making a stab at the name. It's, it's an oddball. Uh, I want to say thank you all for uh, being here this evening and just taking stand in the government and doing a lot of things that uh, I know have a lot of difficulty to them. So I appreciate all the efforts you all put in and keeping us safe and making the city and the county work. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm at 235 Woodlands Drive there. Uh, got medically discharged from the military about two years ago and uh, found that Bastrop was a place that I really wanted to kind of spend the rest of my time in my life at. And um, a, a lot of my fellow residents here in, in the neighborhood have already uh, voiced a lot of the concerns that I have around safety and uh, changes to the ecology and the environment. And uh, it's Woodlands Drive, it's a very wooded area and a very beautiful place with a lot of wildlife to it. And um, uh, I know that something of this size would certainly have an impact, uh, not only on our neighborhood, but uh, 
city of Bastrop uh, at large. Uh, I grew up in uh, Northern Virginia outside of DC and I used to see subdivisions like this come in and come in and come in uh, during my whole growing up there. And uh, as a lot of concerns, concerns have been stated is that uh, it, it definitely will change things. Having, having something of this size, not just for the residents of the woodlands, but uh, I've, I've heard a few different numbers. I don't know if it was 1,300 or 1,600 or however many houses are gonna come in on, on 267 acres works out to a, about a fifth of an acre per house. And it's, 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 a lot of, it's, it's a lot to be cramming into such a small area. And my concern is uh, certainly for our own well-being and our safety in the, in the woodland subdivision, but also the changes that'll come down uh, to the city of Bastrop, add in probably about 25 or 30 percent to the population of the city just by having something of this size come in. And, and I've, I've seen the, uh, the amount of change that can take place with that. And uh, I, can, I can certainly say that more is not necessarily better when it comes to introducing a, a, a lot more congestion into a, a city so lovely as Bastrop. So um, yeah, I just want to express love for the town and uh, appreciate what y'all are doing here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Christy Welsh. Hi, uh, my name is Christy Welsh. I am not a public speaker, so bear with me. Um, I live at 245 Woodlands Drive. Um, thank you, Mayor and, and Council uh, members for hearing us today. Um, I'm going to be opposed to the new development specifically for the cut through road. Um, through Woodlands Drive. Um, we moved here from uh, North San Antonio where they were packing in developments in every square inch they could fit them in, and the traffic was awful. Drivers would cut through our neighborhood and, to avoid the traffic backup, and uh, frequently uh, drivers would fly through stop signs near our house. Um, it was a concern um, mainly for, my, for our children. I have a four-year-old that has no concept of danger and just kind of runs out. So every time he went out that front door, it scared me to death. Um, when we moved to Bastrop, which we looked high and low all over uh, the Travis and Bastrop County, we absolutely loved Bastrop and, and everything about it. Um, we found our, and our first priority was um, to the safety of our children. Um, we were thrilled when we found the Woodland subdivision because it was a country setting. It was safe for my children. The only one road in and out was one way. I knew that my neighbors were, you know, kind of looking out for my kids. And um, that was just absolutely just, we couldn't ask for a better place. And... Now that this uh, proposed development is looking through a cut through, that proposed, that's, that's a concern for us. Um, we take walks on Woodlands Drive. Um, as a lot of my neighbors know me as the lady with the stroller, I go through um, up and down uh, Woodlands in the evenings. Um, and um, as some of my other neighbors have said, uh, the road isn't perfect. It's a little advanced in age. And so the sides are kind of falling, uh, falling off. So I have to actually be in the middle of the road. So to, so my stroller doesn't roll. We have very steep embankments. There's just no way to be off the side. Um, and my children do go with me on a walk and, um, my neighbors know that they've got to kind of make a wide berth for my four year old so that he doesn't decide to just pop out and run into traffic and they know us. They know we, we can um, um, walk in safely. I know I can walk safely with my children. Um, from what I'm seeing of all the different roads going out, I don't think it's necessary for them to cut through Woodlands Drive. They say, again, uh, other neighbors have spoke to as well, but they say this is gonna be a neighborhood good, but they can't control the number of cars that go through Woodlands Drive. Um, we are connected to 71, it's an easy way. It's all, it looks like all the other roads are proposed, but it's an easy way to connect um, to Woodlands and not have to do much. Um, the development is not going to pay for sidewalks and, and to uh, ensure the safety of the Woodlands residents. They're not gonna do anything um, to, and, and you know, They've said, you know, it's just a minor problem, but they're not, oh, my time has expired. Sorry. Thank you. Well, you can wind up. We don't have to uh, touch uh, uh, Sorry. They, um, 
they're 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 working on on their development. They're not working on on what our concern as a neighbor. And I don't think that's very neighborly of them. We're okay with the development, but we want to make sure that our safety of our children are are, are maintained. Thank, Thank you, you. Ms. Wells. You did great. All right, Joe Welsh. Joe Welsh. See, he didn't want to follow. You know, uh, if you want to speak, that's fine, but you can't speak from there because then they can't hear you at home. So you have to come to the microphone. No, I have no desire to speak. I just want to say I have Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Welsh. All right. Suzanne Gambino? Yes, I'm here. All right. Oh. Well, you are allowed to change your mind, so come on up. You get three minutes if you'll say your name and yes, your address. Yes, Suzanne Gambino. I live at 132 um, Sawmill Court, which is a cul-de-sac off of Woodlands Drive. Thank you so much for your service and your um, volunteer and your work that you do for our city. Um, so my husband and I, Rick, we lived in Austin for nine years in a condo. He's a welder. I'm a teacher. It took a lot of savings and a lot of really hard work for us to buy our dream here in Bastrop. He is a Bastrop High School graduate. I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. So um, it was a big deal for us to move to the country and come to Bastrop. Um, I'm a teacher. I've taught special ed for 22 years. And so it's um, um, a pleasure of mine to serve the city in that way. Um, many of the neighbors, I think, um, will agree that we moved there because we wanted to live in the country. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, I'm used to speaking to little kids all day long, but for some reason you get up here in front of adults and it's like, oh my gosh, I forgot how to talk. Um, <laughs> um, so in our neighborhood, uh, me as well as other neighbors, we have horses and we like to ride our horses. Um, and we ride our horses on those roads. We also have a neighbor who has a business, a horse riding business, and she is teaching other people how to ride horses by using those streets, the roads, I should say. Um, I'm not going to repeat what all of the other um, neighbors have said about the condition of the road. I think we made that clear. Um, just in closing, um, happy residents make good citizens for Bastrop. And we would all be very, very happy uh, living in our little country setting if we did not have the cut through to the development. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Gambino. All right, and I have Rick Gambino, and you didn't want to speak either. Have you changed your mind? All right. Supporting the wife. Good move. Good move. All right. Um, that is all of the folks that we have signed up. Is there anybody else that was wanting to speak that didn't get a chance to speak? So you didn't fill out the card because? I think you filled out the one that came in the mail. So I think he's, and I think I have, I think I have it. I have that in my table, so. Okay, so Mr. Attorney, what's my, can I just have them come forward and say their name and address or what's the right way to do it? Sounds like there was a miscommunication. Mayor, under the circumstances, I would say it's at the discretion of the mayor to allow it to go on and they can cite their paperwork, such as name and address into the record verbally. Okay, that's what I'm gonna do. Um, I, Nola Lynn. Nola or Kevin, who wants to go first? Oh uh, yeah, wives are going first tonight. All right, Nola Lynn, if you'll state your name and address. Hi, I am, my name is Nola Lynn. I live at 37, excuse me, I started quoting an old address. 431 Woodlands Drive. Justin is my neighbor right across from me. Our property borders on to the property and that's why when I filled out the form it was the one that we got in the mail. Okay. I was one of the, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the three that spoke originally at the first meeting and I was very discouraged on how we were treated in that our opinion didn't count. Um, we were pretty much led to believe that um, Bastrop's gonna need to make money, this is gonna happen, and we need to be neighborly and accept that our road's gonna be used. And that really made me sad and angry at the same time. So again, I am vehemently opposing the throughway for the Woodlands Drive into this new development. It is right outside my house. And um, I spoke up also about the animals because that 400 acres has been like that for a long time. 
The colony has come in. The colony is coming in above. This is now coming in. So all that's left is the Duff property below us and our property for those animals. We have deer, we have bobcats, we have coyotes, we have uh, squirrels, we have um, coyotes. And they're gonna have to go somewhere. And I hate that they are getting taken down as the don't care because of the almighty dollar. They're gonna come onto our property. So if we're gonna have all that extra traffic that is just gonna, it's not gonna work. We're quite happy to have the wildlife come live with us. Um, I always refer to where I live, in the city, in the country, because it's 10 minutes down to downtown Bastrop, which we all said we love. We love where we live, but it is a country road. We want to keep our neighborhood a country environment. And Raquel may not have spoken, but she handed in a petition from all of our neighbors. We had a meeting on our street, um, and you will have a lot more signatures there of people that are not here speaking today that are also vehemently opposing the road going through. We know the development's gonna happen. We're gonna have to live with that. We're gonna miss the wildlife being able to be free, but we do not want that road connection. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lynn. All right, Mr. Lynn, are you gonna follow her? All right, Kevin Lynn. Hi, my name is Kevin Lynn, and I'm at uh, 431 Woodlands Drive, and I do oppose it. Uh, my main, one of my main concerns besides is the wildlife, and also um, I do have a little bit of a farm going, and my concern is that the city of Bastrop, if that becomes the city of Bastrop, how many problems are we gonna have with the, all the small little houses gonna be built next to me when they start complaining if I got chickens or goats or doing my work in my, on my property? Because uh, I used to live in a suburb and where people would complain if you took out an angle grinder and did a little bit of a home project. People complain, and it's one of the reasons I moved out there because it's dead quiet, nobody complains when I do my work. Um, as far as the through road, I'm opposed to that as well because I do walk my dogs along the road whenever I'm, I get a chance to do it and it's, it's nice, it's peaceful, it's quiet out there and having a lot of traffic go through, I can see that there will be a lot of issues with uh, people. I know people will be racing along and, and as I said, most of the people when they do go for a walk out there, it's like an unknown or unspoken rule. If you're in a car, you slow down. You know, pedestrians have the right of way on our road. You know, if somebody's out there walking with kids, dogs, whatever, you slow down, go past, and I don't see people in a subdivision really doing that, especially if it's a shortcut going through from 71. That's it. Okay, Thanks. thank you very much. I think there was one more hand, and I don't have any more cards. So if you'd just please come forward and state your name and give us your address, we would love to hear from you. So I did mail it in, <clears throat> so you'll probably get it tomorrow. Okay, with the way the mail sorry. Goes. My name is Dewan Fields, and I live at 105 George Kimball Cove. I'm in the colony, so I'm on the opposite side of the woodlands. Okay. Um, being in a quandary here, because I know things have to expand, my concern really is about, in addition to what everyone else has said, 969. So this development will cut into 969. Being in the colony, there is a development on one side of 969, the, I guess that would be what, uh, eastern side, western mm -hmm. side, and then there's a development on the eastern side. It is already jammed, and you have people coming southward on 969. It's already dangerous because that's a two-lane highway. It'll take a while for this to start to develop and gain traction, but I don't know where the process is for expanding 969 because it is not gonna hold construction, construction removal, debris removal, trucks going in and out, seeing what's already there with the colony. It's gonna be a nightmare trying to turn in and out, going in and out in that shorter span. Because you're talking less than a quarter of a mile, I mean, of having these two developments and they're still working on them. Colonies talking about adding a school that's just a lot of construction in such a condensed area to say, is it possible to work on the roadway first and then develop? It's almost like putting the cart before the horse because where is this traffic going to go? Um, I know there has to be a road. You know, every, nobody wants it going through their uh, section and I get that, but is there a way to expand 
the more prevalent area first before starting to do that type of construction. And that would be my concern. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Okay, I'm going to ask again, is there anybody else that wants to speak tonight? Okay, then it is 848 and I am closing the public hearing. And the applicant, do you have any, is there any comments that you're wanting to make? Mayor, while the applicant is coming forward, Certainly, uh, Councilmember Jackson. I was going to ask, because I was going to ask later if the applicant could maybe respond to some of these um, concerns from the neighbors of, uh, neighborhood and everything, because it's put me kind of in a quandary too, wondering if, if uh, cutting through the neighborhood and the traffic situations, the things they were talking about, uh, how you feel about that and how you plan to address that. So good evening, uh, Mayor and uh, City Manager and Council Members. My name is Mike Bohm. I'm uh, with DR Horton. We're uh, Continental Homes of Texas. Um, that's part of the development agreement uh, in front of you today. Um, and so um, this development, uh, just real briefly, uh, we presented kind of a development agreement working with staff on um, the overall land plan to match what city zoning and transportation networks and everything involve um, what we're showing today is something that's been in the works uh, a couple months that we've worked excellently with the staff on. And, uh, um, you know, as, as far as uh, land use and everything, we're a single family residential builder. This is uh, right into what uh, our business model is and what we'd like to do on the property. Um, seeing all the uh, residents today uh, come uh, with Woodlands Drive brings up new concerns. And so I think that's something that we'd like to work on addressing um, if possible through, um, you know, crash gate or some sort of network uh, uh, for emergency access only, um, if need be, for that little space um, uh, to Woodlands Drive. So, you know, the land plan as it shows and our phasing of this development, we'd be coming off of FM 969 um, for the initial phases of our development and moving towards the west, um, annexing plots within the city as we go. Um, and so the, um, you know, the strategy would be that that's that's our, our process through and, and providing these additional points of connection eventually along the way. Hope that hopefully address your concern. Do you have another question? I guess uh, since they're one of the major concerns I heard tonight was about the cutting through on Woodland Drive. I mean, is that the only option that you have to uh, for that subdivision that you're planning? Uh, no, sir. No, that's, that's a point of connection to the outside uh, boundary of the property. Um, the main connection is to FM 969. So let me help out with this a little bit by asking the city manager. I believe it's city staff that asked them to hook to Woodlands. Is that correct? Uh, that, is, that is correct in, in accordance with what the master transportation plan lays out and the, the grid network that is part of the objective as described earlier by in the staff presentation it is so i just we need to be clear that it's um the developer didn't say hey we really want to run through woodlands city staff is following the connectivity because i believe um and this bills you may be the best person to answer this but from 71 to the end of woodlands that is a mile and a half that's one way in and one way out and we are talking about uh, we're at the 10th anniversary of the complex fire, and we've got two council members that live in Tahitian, and we've there is some experience in issues with one way in and one way out. Now, that being said, um, city manager, would you comment on um, an emergency only? Is you know is that a possible um, middle ground that it's that it would be an access that's only for emergencies? Yeah, and I, I appreciate the uh, gentleman making the suggestion about a, a crash gate and that, yeah, we would certainly be happy to take a look at that as we move through the process. Um, as, as we indicated earlier, there are other steps that still need to happen with the, with the, with the platting process and that's certainly, um, that's council's interest. We could certainly strongly evaluate that as we move on. 
Okay, I, I feel like, and, and we can't have everyone speak again, but if it was a, an emergency crash and an emergency exit, I feel like that, I'm, I'm getting some nods and not the angry glares I was getting earlier. So I think that may, that may help with things. The other thing for you guys to realize is that that road came all the way to the property and dead ended. And there, someone, when they originally built Woodlands, which was probably before many of you lived there, they thought that road would continue on. If they didn't want the road to continue, it would have been a cul-de-sac and there would have been lot lines and there wouldn't be a connection. So it, it's, it's two sides of a coin, right? And there could be a time, when the public hearing is closed, the public hearing is closed, so council's gonna talk about things, but there could be a time when you might be very happy that there is a way to get out of that and, and maybe if it's backed up to 71 that you're able to get to 969. But the things that are really important for the neighborhood to understand is that the developer has shown a connection to Woodlands because staff is following the B3 code, the lessons learned from the complex fire of having connectivity. So if, if you're irritated, be irritated at us. We set the policy, staff's enforcing that policy. That being said, given the conditions that we have, it sounds like the city manager, the emergency crash through to address an emergency situation is one possible solution. I also want to address, there was some comments about this seems really conceptual, and I would remind you in the packet, uh, we're, we're on step one of 27, and there will be a finalized drainage plan that's done by a professional engineer that's reviewed. So, so part of why they don't have all of their final construction plans is they'd like a, a shot that this is what the layout looks like before they produce final construction plans to be told, hey, we'd really like you to move this alignment. So they, they, we are in the process and we are in the beginning part of the process. So that's why things are in concept. Councilmember Peterson. Yes, Mayor. A well, gentleman back here brought up a very interesting question about uh, traffic on 969. I just want to ask the developer, has, has anyone talked with TxDOT about putting a left turn lane in? Yes, sir. Yes. So we, uh, as part of this development, are required to do a traffic impact analysis. And so that is in the works and it's been submitted to TxDOT as well as Bastrop County to look at and review. And it, it comes up with mitigation uh, procedures uh, for this area and the surrounding area um, to help alleviate some of the traffic concerns that this development would bring. Very good. Thank you. Excellent question, Mr. Peterson. And I believe then the other part of what we're talking about in this concept plan is if, you, as you're working with TxDOT, they may have you move where that intersection point with 969 is that could move north or south a little bit. And, you, and they'll have to comply. So everyone knows 969 is TxDOT. That is not a city road. So they'll, they have to get permission from TxDOT. It, Council, other questions for the applicant? And Mayor, the other thing I want to bring up, I mean, the main comment I was going to say, I also there was comments about drainage. Some of that stuff is studies. This is very conceptual land plan, and that's what we're doing is a uh, land use within the PID boundary and then uh, moving back towards more detailed engineering studies and making sure everything works within the codes that are uh, approved. Okay, thank you. Council yep. Member Jackson? Right, hearing that, you know, that was staff's recommendation and that uh, maybe a crash gate of some kind can be established and some of the other things, and... Since we're early in the development stage, that kind of allays some of my fears. I'm still a little bit concerned because of the number of um, comments that came from the audience, from the, the citizens, and I'm, I'm just wondering if the developer is going to be able to work with them and take into consideration some of those concerns because it, uh, there were quite a few, and uh, a lot of them were quite disturbing, and especially with the connection I heard from one uh, property owner about the... Um, the, tra the uh, RV park and how that's going to impact that by dividing the property and some other things. And there were just several things that um, were alarming to me. And if it's alarming to me, I'm sure it's alarming to some of the residents of that subdivision. And so um, I'm kind of between a rock and a hard place, a uh, rock and a hard place right now, trying to decide on how I'm going to go along with this or not. But uh, since it has several more steps, I just want to see if you are willing to try to work more with those neighbors that had concerns and see if there's another way of addressing that. And I just, I'm asking you directly that question. Yes, sir. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we can, um, 
you know, again, what, what's shown is, uh, you know, within the, the property boundaries of the 400 acres that's part of this development agreement, uh, I think it was brought up initially that the highlighted roadways outside are uh, based off a of master transportation plan the city's adopted and working with city staff on those networks of what's planned for the future. Um, but yes, very much willing and um, able to and can uh, provide contact information for, for us as developer of this tract. Right, particularly disturbing was the fact that I think one of the residents said she had called 11 times and had not gotten a response and it's directly affecting her property and I don't know if there are others that are having similar problems but that's, that's, an, that's also disturbing and I'm hoping that uh, you'll be able to reach out to her and talk to her a little bit about that later on and sure. see if that can be resolved. Yes, sure, we can do that. Thank you, Councilmember Jackson. Councilmember Rogers? Well, I, I kind of I agree a lot with what Councilmember Jackson's saying about these, the woodlands and going into the, the other subdivisions and the master, the master transportation plan. I cannot talk tonight. So I just don't understand how they can make connections without getting the property owner, how could they, connecting to the woodlands without woodlands saying you can. You see what I'm saying? Is that part of the master transportation plan? Am I misunderstanding it? So that, so when you do subdivisions and phases or standalone subdivisions a lot of mm -hmm. times, um, we have what's called stub outs. So you have a right of way that literally dead ends of the next property and the intention is to continue that uh, on. So while woodlands functions as a cul-de-sac and it's got the turnaround at the end, if you actually look, the right of way was dedicated all the way to the property line to continue it on. So okay. with our master transportation plan and the county's plan, the intention was always to connect that okay, back that's what somehow. I wanted, uh, thank you for answering that question for and me. And the same with the sure. properties right to the south. That, that RV park has developed since our master transportation plan was adopted. So those are the master transportation roads shown you know, when it was adopted and developed in 2016-17. When we update our master transportation plan, we'll have to look at those newly developed conditions and figure out if we need to adjust roads at that point. Um, but similarly, those, when we get to the plats in those areas, we'll look at those stub outs to the next property um, when those plats come in. Okay, thank you for answering that question. I was just trying to make sure I understood how, it, how they can do things like that. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Rogers. Mayor Pro Tem Nelson. One of the beauties of having a public hearing is to be able to, to, to get input from people uh, and ideas that, that, that perhaps did not occur. And one of the things we've found is that the developer is willing to make some modifications in working with the city to, to, to perhaps block the road in some way, shape, or form to still allow emergency access. Uh, the process is so early in, in, we're so early in the process that it is, uh, uh, advantageous for us to, to listen and act upon those things. I, I always say analyze, assess, plan, and then act. And I, I appreciate your offer of, of doing so. I think this is something that we can continue to have an open dialogue on. And with Councilmember Jackson's comment about the residents there in the woodlands, we have to remember that this entire area was undeveloped at one point in time. And whenever homes went in, that was disturbing some level of wildlife and somebody who was already living there in some way, shape, or form. Not to discount y'all's concerns in any way, shape, or form, for sure. But this is so early in the process, and please uh, allow us to continue, the city staff as well as the developer, to continue the dialogue to make sure your needs are addressed. There's, it's a private property owner. We didn't invite them in. They came in and said, this is something, a viable process that we think we want to go through. It's part of being a capitalistic society, so it's uh, it's something that we need to listen to 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 friends and neighbors, but we still need to understand that growth is coming to Bastrop County, whether we want it or not. It's just a matter of us managing that growth by getting optimum input from the citizens. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Nelson. All right, Council, are there any other questions for staff or the applicant? I would just like the, the developer to know that as your process goes through, I will be watching to make sure that you're actually paying attention to your neighbor's requests. And I'm taking your word that you're gonna honor those and you're gonna follow what their needs. So I'm gonna watch to make sure you're gonna do that. Ditto. Okay.
OK, I move to approve. Is somebody <laughs> waiting on me to say it? I have a motion to approve from Council Member. With my eye on you. <laughs> a motion to approve from Council Member Rogers with the evil eye. I'll second. And a second from Council Member Peterson. Is there any further discussion? And this council would be approving the development agreement, which, as we said, is um, one of the first steps in the process. With no hearing no further discussion, Madam Secretary, if you'll call the roll. Council Member Rogers? Yes, step Council one. <laughs> Council Member Peterson? Yes. Council Member Jackson? Yes, with concerns. Council Member Crouch? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Nelson? Yes. Thank you, Council. The motion passes with a 5-0 vote, and we are going to take a five-minute break because I think there's going to be a lot of movement in the room. Thank you. One person signed up for citizen comments. Madam Secretary, do you have anyone else signed up for citizen comments or just the one? Just the one, Mayor. All right, Mr. J. Howard. Mr. J. Howard with citizen comments. Yes. Hello. Uh, my name is J. Howard. I'm with Texas Disposal Systems. Mayor, Council, City Manager, thank you for giving me a few minutes of your time uh, this evening. I just wanted to come by and introduce myself our company and express our interest in, in possibly at someday doing business with the city. We, we, Texas Disposal Systems, is a private family owned company based about 30 miles west of here in Creedmoor, Texas. Um, we are in the solid waste and recycling services business. Uh, in addition to being a service provider, we actually own and operate a large scale landfill there in Creedmoor as well as a uh, recycling facility and composting facility. Um, as far as this area goes, we have a lot of residential and commercial customers just outside of your city limits. We have a partnership uh, with the independent school district here in Bastrop for all of the campuses just outside of the city limits. We don't take care of the, the campuses inside city, city limits because they fall under your current solid waste contract. Um, and as I'm sure you're all very aware, um, y'all are in the midst of a seven-year contract with your current hauler that, if I understand correctly, is up at the end of next year, toward the end of next year, so more than a year off at this point. Uh, but I'm assuming it between now and then, you all will be discussing and considering whether or not to renew that existing contract or open uh, it up to competitive bids. And obviously, I'm here tonight to pitch for opening up to competitive bids. We'd love to be able to throw our hat in the ring uh, next year uh, and uh, compete for your business. So we hope to have that opportunity. I've had a chance to visit with Mr. Hoffman. Uh, I've left my contact information on the comment card if anybody would like to reach out. I'd love to visit with you about our company, what we do, and how we uh, work with the communities and, and customers we take care of. So. Uh, anyway, I will stay in touch uh, and look forward to seeing you all again soon. I appreciate you giving me a few minutes tonight. Thank you very much, yes. Mr. Howard. You know that we can't discuss that because it's not of on course, the agenda, but course. you get the E for effort for staying through <laughs> all of that. So we appreciate well, that. Thank you. Y'all take care. And Madam Secretary, we don't have anyone else signed up for citizen comments? No, Mayor. All right, Council, we're moving on to the consent agenda, and I'm going to be pulling these items separately. Item 12A is consider action to approve City Council minutes from the June 22nd, 2021 regular meeting. Move to approve. I have a move to approve from Mayor Pro Tem Nelson and a second from Council Member Jackson. Is there any further discussion? Madam Secretary, if you'll call the roll. Count Mayor Pro Tem Nelson? Yes. Council Member Jackson? Yes. Council Member Quach? Yes. Council Member Rogers? Yes. Council Member Peterson. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. On item 12B, Mayor Pro Tem Nelson will be recusing himself. Consider action to approve the second reading of ordinance number 2021-08 of the City Council of the City of Bastrop, Texas, approving the 2021 service plan update, including provisions related to the assessments for the Hunters Crossing Public Improvement District, approving a fiscal year 2022 assessment role for the district containing other provisions related to Hunters Crossing Public Improvement District, and the Hunters Crossing Local Government Corporation and providing for an effective date. Move for approval. I have a motion to approve from Councilmember Jackson. Second. And a second from Councilmember Crouch. Is there any further discussion? Yes, ma'am. 
I just would like to state that I sit on that Hunter's Crossing PID um, board, vote on that, and I abstain from that vote, but I vote for yes for this one. Thank you very much. Madam Secretary, if you'll call the roll. Council Member Jackson? Yes. Council Member Crouch? Yes. Council Member Rogers? Yes. Council yes. Member Peterson? Yes. The motion passes 4-0. Mayor Pro Tim Nelson will be rejoining us. Council, we already took care of item 13A. We are moving on to item 13B. Consider action to approve resolution number R2021-68 of the City Council of the City of Bastrop, Texas, awarding a contract for Myers Concrete Construction in the amount of $596,545.70 for the construction of the River Loop Sidewalk Project attached as Exhibit A, authorizing the city manager to execute all necessary documents, providing for a repealing clause and establishing an effective date. Hi, Fabiola. Hello. I think I went too far. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. What I have in front of you tonight is a construction call for the River Loop Sidewalk Project. I'm presenting on behalf of Tony Bonadono, city engineer and also project manager on this project. He wanted to be with us tonight and he was gonna to try to join us uh, virtually, but I think he's still having issues online. So I'll continue with the presentation. So a little bit of background, we advertised for this project sometime the end of May until uh, beginning of uh, June. We received, we opened bids on June 17th and we received five qualified bids. Uh, and Myers Concrete Construction was the lowest responsible bidder with an amount of $596,546.70. Uh, the other bids range from about $650,000 and $1,250,000. Uh, the engineer's cost estimate was around $806,000. The bid was checked for accuracy by the engineer of record, Bowman Consulting. The reference were checked and they're all positive. And Bowman Consulting is recommending award of Myers Concre Concrete Construction. And we have a representative with us here tonight from Bowman Consulting, is Mia Hernandez. Uh, this is the project work limits. Uh, we are going uh, starting on the intersection of Old Austin Highway with 150 loop going south until 71 Frontage Road and then east until Perkins Street. And the other section is at the intersection of Main Street and Austin Street going south until College Street. So with your approval tonight, we'll execute this agreement between city and the contractor. We intend to uh, provide a notice to proceed uh, this month and then starting construction in August. And the timeline of this project is substantial completion within 180 days within notice to proceed and final completion 200 days from the notice to proceed. So with the approval of this, uh, this uh, city of uh, the engineering department uh, recommends that you authorize the approval of resolution number R2021-68 to award a construction contract to Myers Concrete Construction for the city of Bastrop River Loop Sidewalk Project in the amount of $596,545.70. And I'll take any questions at this moment. Council, any questions? I so move that we go ahead to authorize the approval of resolution R-2021-68 to award a construction contract to Myers Concrete Construction to the City of Bastrop River Loop Sidewalk Project in the amount of 596 You don't have to do all that. We got you. you well, second. I choose to do it. Okay. I'm sorry. That's part. That is my motion. Okay. And did you, did you want to finish any more of the amount or anything? You didn't say 40 cents. <laughs> well, I was, cut, I was cut off. Okay. And 70 cents. All right. Second. I have a motion from Councilmember Jackson. I have a second from Councilmember Peterson. Is there any further discussion? Madam Secretary, if you'll call the roll. Council Member Jackson? Yes. Council Member Peterson? Yes. Council Member Crouch? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Nelson? Yes. Council Member Rogers? Yes. Thank you, Council. Unanimous approval. It's been a long time coming. I know there's some folks that are going to be really anxious and excited to have that done. As Council, as we spoke earlier, item 13C has been pulled by the applicant. We all remember item 13D. We're moving on to item 13E. Consider action to approve resolution number R2021-67 of the City Council of the City of Bastrop, Texas, approving an agreement for the emergency communication services between Bastrop County and the City of Bastrop, attached as Exhibit A, authorizing the City Manager to execute all necessary documents 
documents, providing for a repealing clause and establishing an effective day. Chief Nagy. Yes. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Council, City Manager. All right. Uh oh, Colin, what am I doing? Going the wrong way. Am I going the wrong way? All right, here we go. <laughs> All right. I'm still going the wrong way. <laughs> I'm not clicking. <laughs> there we go. All right. So, yes, um, this is going to be a discussion of the Bastrop and uh, really Bastrop County or the Bastrop County Emergency uh, Communication Center to go ahead and continue the current agreement that we have. Uh, just prior to council, I put up a new resolution, and there was no major changes to that resolution other than it was in the packet, other than it clarified what an agreement was. I used the word agreement, it was a little ambiguous, and now it is called the first modification to that agreement. Uh, so the city of Bastrop, the, our police and our fire services are dispatched by the Bastrop County Emergency Communication Center. And currently, we pay just about $286,000 a year, and that has been the case for 28, uh, through 2018 through this fiscal year. Uh, the agreement is a two-year term, and then each year after that is also a one-year term unless we come back and make some sort of adjustments. So now, uh, in the new fiscal year, we are pending an increase of just about $45,000. That would start on October 1st of 2021 for the new total of about $330,000 for the next two years. Of course, that's on an annual basis, so we'll pay that every year for the next two years. I wanted to give you just a little bit of uh, a feedback on what dispatch does for our city. Uh, first, they are obviously a 24-7 service, that it, and we have a dedicated dispatcher, uh, particularly for the police department, because we do have quite a bit of calls. And they also dispatch for numerous other police services, uh, other fire departments, ESDs, and also start for dispatch of, as, uh, for EMS as well. They're a standalone county department. They used to be associated with the sheriff's office, but they are now standalone. I think that's been since 2016 or 2017. 26, 26 full-time employees, uh, four shift commanders, and they also have uh, supervision uh, on every day. And then they have a director as well. Uh, so once again, 24-7, police and fire, that includes traffic stops, crashes, any type of critical incident. Sometimes that is just a basic phone call as well, animal services, and also code compliance. I have quarterly meetings with the director and uh, their supervision, and Chief on, uh, Andres Rosales also has those as well. They incur all costs of the dispatcher's equipment and training, and that is really important in this day and age as we're trying to hire people. And then fire is dispatched by them, but with this new agreement or this new uh, modification to the agreement, fire is technically no longer gonna be charged for their calls for service. The main reason for that is because the ESDs are not being charged, so it wasn't necessary for to charge us as well. So our citywide call volumes, uh, so from, I'm sure that should be 2018, we've had about 17,000 and that has increased to 22,019. And we've stayed about the same with the slight increase uh, that is in 2020, or I'm sorry, fall in 2020, and then from 21 to uh, July now, we're probably gonna see increase for this fiscal year, uh, this calendar year as well. And total calls uh, for the 911 system, so this is all calls going in for um, all of Bastrop County. It's about 48,000 911 calls. They field about 86,000 non-emergency calls. They answer their calls within about 10 seconds, about 97% of time, and that is really, really good. So they're, uh, they really wanna make sure that they're really above that 95%, and they're just at about 97, almost 98%. And they dispatch a total of just about 86,000 calls through the, uh, the computer-aided dispatch system. This is just a quick picture of what their dispatch center is like. So once they went kind of stand alone, uh, they were still housing a sheriff's office, but over the last, I think it's been about two years, they opened up this really fantastic center. Uh, it is very large, they got room to grow, and they've got top of the line equipment. Uh, Elgin also has a dispatch, but their PSAP is closing down. So PSAP is, uh, is the answering system for the county through 911 and Bastrop County is just gonna start a contract with them to pull in the Elgin calls as well. So really just a review, 
Uh, from 2018 to 2019, we just paid about $286,000. The modification to this agreement, so we're only modifying just the compensation portion of this agreement, it's about $45,000. The total amount for 2022 is gonna be $330,000. Uh, once again, that takes place on October 1st of this year. Quarterly payments are due the 1st of October, January 1st, April, and then in July. And we have also kind of allocated those budgets for this year's proposed budget. Thank you very much, Chief yes. Nagy. I believe um, my understanding from talking with city manager is there is no way we could start our own and do it for that amount of money. That's correct. We would look at about uh, $600,000 dollars $700,000 really just to get us started. So there, it's one of those times where there yes. is definitely leverage and advantages to working together with the partnership. Yes. Councilmember Rogers. So, yes, did you say this, this amount, this, it's an increase, but it locks us in for two years? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So annually for two years. Mayor Pro Tem Nelson? I think Mr. Peterson. Councilmember Peterson? Move for approval. I have a motion to approve from Councilmember Peterson. Second. second. I have a second from uh, Councilmember Jacks. Or is it Crouch or Jack? It's Jackson. Doc, Doc beat me. Doc beat you. Okay. So I've got Councilmember Peterson with the motion, Councilmember Jackson with the second. Is there any discussion, Mayor Pro Tem Nelson? Yes, there is. By the way, uh, I, I certainly see the cost benefit of a collaborative venture with the county, and I was happy to hear that, that Elgin will be joining in. Does Smithville involved in it in any way, shape, or form? They are not, no. And I don't, uh, Smithville won't be. Okay, yes. that, that's pretty clear. <laughs> and there's also with with uh, excuse me, with PSAPs there's also a move toward toward regional coordination and, yes. and redundancy in, in play there. And you said this, the fire department is not charged for their calls anymore. Yet our cost is going up 20 percent. Do we have an explanation of why it went up 20 percent? Yes. Uh, so for last year, 2018 through uh, 2019, our costs are. Uh, we, we've done a lot better job of calculating how we're getting our calls. So we're, we are getting a, I think, a good deal on, on this process, at least for these next two years, because we're actually calculated from 2018 to 2019 how many calls went into that system, and then everything is applied a, to the total amount. I'm not being clear. <laughs> no, no, you, um, are, you yeah. are. Uh, and so just kind of as we go up in calls for service, as uh, dispatch, um, as their costs go up, we have to cover a little bit more of those costs. So more of a pro rata share. Yes, yes. But and, you're, and, but I'm you're sorry. satisfied with with the rate of with the, the return on our, our our city investment. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Nelson, City Manager. Did you want to make a statement? Yeah, I was just going to add that one of the reasons for the cost increase is the uh, the compensation increases for the communication officers yes. or the dispatchers that uh, that is a really competitive area and uh, peace apps all over the region are struggling to make sure those positions are filled uh, I know that's a real priority of the county I, I, I agree with Chief Nagy I think that's a, a very well run operation there's a lot of uh, pretty intense personnel management that goes along with that so it's not just the six hundred thousand dollars that we would have to outlay if we were to run a piece app on our own that's 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 not an easy operation to add to the to the mix and that's great. and we and the, the county is, holds themselves accountable and we have those quarterly meetings and they've been real responsive to taking care of the city of bastrop yes sir thank you city manager mayor pro tem nelson for our friends at the county, I wouldn't question the validity of the program, only oh, no. questioning the, the, the call, so it would be clarification yes. for me. So. All right, any further discussion? I have a motion and a second. Madam Secretary, if you'll call the roll. Council Member Peterson? Yes. Council Member Jackson? Yes. Council Member Crouch? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Nelson? Yes. Council Member Rogers? Yes. Thank you, Council. The motion passes unanimously. Now, what we've all been waiting for. Item 13F, consider action to approve the first reading of ordinance number 2021-11 of the City Council of the City of Bastrop, Texas, amending chapter nine, personnel article 9.01, section 9.01.001 of the Bastrop Code of Ordinances relating to the adoption of the employee handbook, making comprehensive revisions to that handbook, repealing conflicting ordinances and resolutions, including a severability clause. 
establishing an effective date and proper notice and meeting a move to include on the July 27 City Council consent agenda for a second reading. I'm pretty sure that's clause and not cause, but I read it like it was written. All right, Ms. Cantrell, Thank take you. it away. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, Council members. Um, really happy to be here. The good news is I've got this down to a solid 16 minutes, and I talk really fast in front of all of you, so I think I'm going to shave that down to about 8 or 10. Um, before I get started with my presentation, I'd like to give special thanks to Zaina Jones. She's my HR generalist, and she was uh, huge in getting this project done. She was an auditor in our previous life, so she really likes things neat and precise and in order, and she's made um, this personnel employee handbook just look really great, and all of her input has been invaluable, so thank you, Zaina. Rick Gullickson swooped in at the very end with our table of con contents, and did it with a program, um, helped us get it all in line. I can't remember the name of that program, but he was great. This is actually the first document that our CSET team is gonna be pushing out guidelines for our branding and formatting and things like that. So Rick was instrumental in making this document fit all of those uh, guidelines that are gonna be coming down the pike. So that's exciting. I wanna also thank all of the council members for your input throughout all of this process, um, the department directors who reviewed, and also Christian, who is an attorney at the Borquez Law Firm, was uh, instrumental and really helpful and w went through this with a t fine tooth comb and um, was very helpful in getting it all reeled in for us and, and, and the document that's in front of you today. So with that said, we'll move forward. So just a little background, the last revision was completed in 2005, and of course specific chapters have been updated since uh, that were relevant. Um, management and department directors conducted a comprehensive review in 2020, and uh, then Human Resources incorporated those changes. We've also utilized Texas Municipal Human Resources Association Employee Handbook Toolkit that uh, is available to us, um, and we utilize that as a reference for mandated changes that were added. added. And then City Manager Paul Hoffman completed his review in May of this year, and Christian completed his review in June of 2021 of this year. And here we are tonight. So I'm by no means going to go um, through all of the changes that were completed. I did send a memo in the agenda packet to y'all. Uh, specifically, that's what we're gonna go through tonight. Um, and so with that, we'll just get started. Chapter one, personnel administration introduction. We just incorporated a more welcoming introduction for the employees to kind of let them know what they could expect coming on board with the city of Bastrop. Section two, city government today. Basically, we talk about in that section just what form of government we have, that there's a mayor, five council members, that the mayor only votes in a tie, the city manager doesn't. Just kind of gives them a background because people coming into government don't have that background. So gives them an introduction to that. And then section three was the council meetings. We just wanted to make sure that they know, number one, when the council meetings are, that they're open to the public. And we also cordially invite them in the employee handbook to come to those meetings so they know what's going on at our city. And then also section nine, personnel administration was the city manager's right to get delegate the duties of all of, um, and the authority over all personnel decisions when it comes to uh, the staff. Chapter two, recruitment and selection. Of course, we've always had in the um, handbook that we hire based on knowledge, skills, and abilities and that we don't discriminate. But one of the things that we added in that section was that we also want to promote education and training in order to promote our employees internally when possible. To, so it sets them on a path of, hey, if I get educated and, 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 and some more certifications in this field, I'll have a chance at um, bettering myself at the city. And then section three, applications. We um, introduced our city portal portal uh, for government jobs, and so this just kind of applies to that and, and introduces um, the portal. Chapter three, uh, Equal Employment Opportunity, Section three, Americans with Disabilities Act. That's always been in the handbook. However, we um, added the part of to employees on how they can specifically go about asking for requests on that and that there is a specific form that they can fill out. And chapter five, employee introductory period, section one, fire and police, we changed that from a one year introductory period back to a six month, and that's in line with all of the other personnel. Um, and also leading into that section six, extensions to introductory period, we can also extend those additional six months, and that goes for police, fire, and um, our civilian employees. Um, 
and that's due to marginal performance. They may need it to be extended. Um, they may have been hurt on the job, and you know the supervisor didn't have enough time to amply um, watch their job performance, so they're they're going to extend that, or um, maybe there just wasn't uh, additional training is warranted for them to keep going forward. Uh, chapter 6, Job Classification Plan and Compensation. Section 2, Job Descriptions. Basically what we added in there is just that we have the exclusive right to alter job descriptions to meet the needs of our citizens for service demands, number one. Technology changes and then duty changes may take place as well. Section 10, Overtime, Non-Exempt Employees. Um, we had a few issues. Some of the um, supervisors wanted us to make sure that we really put that in there because employees can't just go work overtime we have budgetary constraints so they they always have to have approval it can't be I have a project has got to get done the supervisors got to make sure that we have that budgeted for and then longevity of course we're proposing the increase from three to five to uh, f three to five dollars during the budget process for those that weren't here uh, during the compensation study we were behind the market on that so we're getting us back into market with that Ms. Kentrell, can I I'm sure. sorry for interrupting you but may, can I ask a quick question is is it the intention that the employee handbook will be reviewed annually and that's why you're putting the dollar amount in there? Because I think that's a number that could change and I, is that making you have to changing it and is it okay because you plan on reviewing it annually? I do plan to review it annually. Okay, thank yes. you. Mm -hmm. And then chapter seven, uh, performance evaluations, section one, employee performance evaluations. That's always been in there, but we really define that for employees so they know what to expect. When they hire on, they get an evaluation at three months, let them know how they're doing. They get one again at six months, and then they get one annually um, on their uh, anniversary date uh, after that point. So we just want to make sure that they know what, what their expectations should be from us as an employer. And then chapter eight, attendance and leave benefits, section one, work hours. This um, we pulled out for, from FLSA for our police because they do work a different work week than us. Um, overtime isn't required for law enforcement until after 86 hours during a 14 day work, work period. And then FLSA states for uh, fire that it's when it exceeds 106 hours in a 14 day work period, then overtime applies. So we define that for our employees. And then chapter eight, attendance and leave, section two, holidays. Of course, we added the floating holiday and that will be effective f fiscal year 22. Section three, vacation leave, leave accrual, leave accrual tables for employees and firefighters, just to kind of give them an example of what that looks like. And um, military leave, call to duty, this has to do with um, our people that are called back to service. And we just wanted to make sure that they understand that they have 15 days of paid leave if they are called back, if they do have accrued uh, vacation and sick time um, accrued after beyond, and they have to stay beyond those 15 days and they can use that as well. And then inclement weather, we really didn't have that address. Of course, the city offices always remain open. We are very proud of that. We um, are always going to offer our services during extraordinary circumstances, but sometimes we do have to close. And so we kind of wanted to give employees an idea of what to, what to expect. Um, when the city manager does determine that certain offices are going to be closed, then the affected personnel are granted leave. However, if we say, no, it's everybody's got to get here, but somebody may have uh, fear for their life or property, um, they can let their supervisor know that they don't feel safe and take a vacation day for that particular day. Uh, employee real conduct. Quick, real, real quick. Yes. Quick question. If, if you say they can take a vacation day. If they have no no time accumulated to sleep without pay, then mm -hmm. thank you. Yes, sir. Um, and section three solicita solicitation. Oh, I'm sorry. Chapter nine employee conduct and work rules. Section three solicitations and acceptance of gifts prohibited. Um, basically, that's always been in there, but we it's now in line with the charter. We put that fifty dollar amount in there, and then if they are presented with an appreciation gift, they have to let their supervisor and HR and the city manager know. And chapter 10, Discipline, Appeals, and Grievances, Section 9, Appeals of Disciplinary Action. Uh, basically, the one thing that we pointed out in there is that directors, uh, director level and above don't, don't have any right to appeal. Um, that stops at the city manager. So this includes disciplinary action and termination.
Chapter 12, personnel records, confidentiality of medical information. Federal law requires that we keep this information separate from the regular personnel files. That's the way we've always done it, but we just wanted to define that in the handbook and just to make employees feel more comfortable that the FMLA paperwork that they bring to us, workers' comp releases, those kinds of things aren't gonna be for anybody else's eyes except for HR. Chapter 13, Employee Benefits, Section 1, Medical Insurance. Basically, these are all these are both federal mandates, too, that needed to be included in the handbook. Uh, full-time employees used to be a 40-hour week to provide full 100% coverage for medical. Now that looks like 30 hours a week. And then also benefits used to kick in 90 days first of the month. Now we're fe that's federally mandated, too, that it has to be 60 days, uh, less than that time frame. So it's now at 60 days first of the month except for your department uh, directors and city manager, when they come on, they, their uh, medical insurance starts the first of the month after they hired. And then chapter 14, uh, travel policy authorization required. We added elected officials to this part. And the reason that we put the city secretary will verify the funds is because she's of course in charge of your bu budgets. So when you submit your travel uh, advancement expenses, uh, and we'll look that over and sign off on that and say, yes, we've got the funds available. Section 5, personal credit cards. Of course, we have city credit cards, so we want the employees to use those first and foremost when traveling. Um, however, we do recognize that sometimes there's emergencies, and so we added it back in the policy that you can use your personal card. We will reimburse you with the appropriate receipts. Just make sure that it's an emergency or unanticipated. And then chapter 14, travel policy, we really used to section out and define how much you're going to get for this on a per diem. Well, we just took that back like we do for our mileage, and we're going to go with the IRS regulations. So you'll be paid in accordance with those on your leave. Right now, the um, tips for per diem for in-state travel overnight for IRS is $66. I did not put that in the policy because, as you know, that changes. So we're just going to say as applicable with whatever IRS is paying at that time. And same for mills out of state. Um, we're going to follow IRS guidelines, and they, they utilize a high-low substantiation method because sometimes when you travel out of state, you may go somewhere. It's a lot cheaper than it is in Texas, or it's either going to be a lot higher. So we'll utilize, it to utilize that and, of course, actual receipts to pay those. And then chapter 15, city property vehicle and equipment use, take home vehicles. We really wanted to hit this home. This probably should be a no brainer, but you know, some people may think, oh, God, I've got to drive home, I'm gonna stop and pick up a 12 pack. Well, no, not in a city vehicle, you're not. <laughs> and then they might think, oh, well, it's my kid's just around the corner, I'm just gonna pick them up. No, you're not. We can't have anybody that's not on official duties because number one, TML is not going to cover that, pas that passenger, and number two, it's a huge liability for us. So we're really going to hit that home for new employees, especially if you have a take-home vehicle, it's you and you only in that vehicle. Uh, chapter 16, Electronic Communications and Systems Access Use, Section 1, Electro what I just said, uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> filtering. Um, we just want to let employees know that, you know, we don't, we do filter here and we don't want them viewing or sending or having access to inappropriate information at the workplace, so we're just letting them know that. Uh, section 2, social media. Basically, this has to do, uh, you know, and a lot of people will say, you know, well, I have my First Amendment right of speech and all of that, and but this really speaks to the fact that it doesn't matter if you're on or off duty. What you do on social media matters, and it really cannot negatively impact or violate city policy. They have the right to speak out as private citizens, but when it comes to that, uh, of matters of public concern, they have to do it in such a way that it doesn't disrupt our operations and it doesn't, um, it, it has to be in line with the mission of the city. So you can't fa look, look, up, look at that and not be favorable to the city. So we kind of hit that home. And then, of course, that the use of city's internet and privilege and city employees must be responsible and ethically use that. And then chapter 17, alcohol and drug abuse. The only thing I'm gonna talk about here is the section two drug and alcohol drug and alcohol policy for our DOT employees, and that's your employees that have CDLs and drive those vehicles. That's actually uh, required by the U.S. Department of uh, Public Safety and the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration that when they do, you have, that's a mouthful, uh, you're required to test your employees, and we want to let them know when that testing is going to happen. It's going to happen for pre-employment, post-accidents, 
um, if, if, if the, our driver, it's their responsibility and they receive a ticket, they'll, they'll be tested. Um, if there's a fatality, it doesn't matter if it's their fault or not, they'll be tested. And then, of course, if we have reasonable suspicion, and then we'll do re random tests as well on them. Chapter 18, miscellaneous provisions, last, last chapter. Section four breaks, we added uh, lactation breaks. Of course, if we have uh, a mother who's breastfeeding and she doesn't have the privacy of her own office, we make sure that we provide a private spot for her to go to to, to um, have that break. So we've added that in there. And then section five, telephone usage, basically just has to do with is we're all deemed essential employees, so we have to have a phone number even if the the employee doesn't have a city phone, we have to have an after an hours number to get a hold of you because if we have to come back in, we're just letting them know we're, you're not gonna be reimbursed for that, but that's part of your duties as an employee that we must, we, we must be able to reach you to in order to bring you back to take care of our citizens. And then section eight, tobacco use, really wanna hit home that we are a smoke-free um, workplace, and this is gonna include, but not limited to cigarettes, e-cigarettes, vaping devices, pipes, cigars, snuff, chewing tobacco, all of it. All of it's prohibited, of course, in city buildings, and you can't um, partake of that within 25 feet of any entrance that the public utilizes or employees utilize, and it's also gonna be mandated that it's prohibited in all city vehicles and garages. And then section 10, the last thing was the dress appearance and uniforms. We just really wanted to clear, uh, clear uh, clearly defi define the city um, expectations here. And that's basically, you're no brainer, but some of it gets a little grayer for people. So we don't want you to wear stuff that promotes tobacco or beer or inappropriate material or wear clothes that are tattered. And I got reamed after we put this out, and they were like, what do you mean no jeans and tennis shoes? And I said, okay, everybody calm down. <laughs> it's different for different um, departments. I mean, because we've got people that are on their feet all day that have to wear tennis shoes. So um, I'll do a little education on that for the employees. But um, that's it in a nutshell, and I'll take any questions you have at this time. Councilmember Rogers. Well, thank you for this, because I know it was one of my projects I gave you a year ago, and you did a fabulous job. I at first was going to ask you to pull it because this packet was very large, and I wasn't able to read all of this. <laughs> but since it's the second reading, I can bring you back more questions next time. Yes, so you can. I'm going to leave it there. And the other, one of my first questions were, the mayor kind of asked that, is this going to be printed, or is they going to get this digitally? It'll be printed. Some will get it digitally, but we'll print it for our field guys that don't have access to computers. The reason I'd asked is you were talking about yes. the numbers we're changing, it. but we, I mean, we just got done changing the holiday thing. That might be something that changes yeah. each year, so I didn't want to mm -hmm. print 100 of them and then toss all those and yeah. print some more. Usually when we have an update like that, we'll print the update, provide it to the employees, and they sign off on that update. We don't print the whole document yeah. again. But okay. this one will be because it's completely revamped. Oh, and it looks fabulous, yeah. but I'll have more questions next time. Okay. Excellent. I'll be ready. <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem Nelson? I want to echo her remarks. It was a really good job. This is very, I appreciated the memo especially. The uh, couple of questions. On the reasonable suspicion uh, mm -hmm. on chapter seven, in Chapter 17, mm -hmm. do we provide training to supervisors what to look for in a reasonable suspicion? Yeah, we would bring in probably our officers on that, um, Officer Nagy, because they are trained on that. Give them a, the down low of what's happening and, and ask for their advice. But yes, that's a good idea. We can provide training for that. And on the telephone usage, should we not include, I guess this is for the city manager more than anything, include our restriction on driving or using a cell phone while driving? Should we not have that also it's in, in our... It's in there. Is it? Yes, sir. Then I'll withdraw that comment. Yes. Councilmember Peterson? It's, maybe I missed it somewhere because it is a big document. Does the city have a um, employee assistance program? We do. Okay. Mm -hmm. One of the things I saw was it said that they're going to read it, and it's 169 pages yeah. and sign that they read it. Mm -hmm. Are you going to do some sort of an orientation, like, you know? Yes, I'm doing Are you going to put them in a dark room and not no. let them out till they can my, answer my, 20 questions? My education for them is going to be a lot longer than 30 slides. It, it'll be okay. a presentation with PowerPoints and everything to go over all the changes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Excellent. Mm -hmm. I just don't want to um, set ourselves up for I just signed it and I didn't yes. really read it and I didn't really know. But it sound, you've oh, more than got that covered. So, 
Okay, Council, any other questions for Ms. Cantrell? Y'all are easy on me tonight. All right, that, does that mean someone's wanting to make a motion? Move to approve. First Second. Reading. I have a motion to approve. Can I ask a clarifying question? Well, I'm going to. It's the way that it's written, it says to put on the consent agenda. Are you, is that included in your motion, knowing that if someone has questions, they can pull it off consent? Is that the intention of your motion? I would prefer it not to be on the consent agenda, so I'll modify my motion if need be to say to be put on a regular agenda. Okay. So I have a motion from Mayor Pro Tem Nelson to approve with it being on the regular agenda. And Councilmember Rogers, is your second still the same? All right. Any further discussion? Madam just Secretary. A, I'm sorry, Councilmember Just Jackson? a comment. Um, and I, I was listening to um, about it's going to be reviewed annually. And in light of the fact that we do have a new federal holiday, uh, I hope that maybe we'll consider that in the revised version next year. I just want to make note and remind people that we do have that. And that doesn't mean we have to do it, but most people are, so. Thank you, Councilmember Jackson. Councilmember Crouch? No, I was just going to vote. Oh, okay. <laughs> Madam Secretary, if you'll call the roll. Mayor Pro Tem Nelson? Yes. Council Member Rogers? Yes. Council Member Jackson? Yes. Council Member Crouch? Yes. Council Member Peterson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Excellent job, Ms. Cantrell. Really good job. And to you and all the team that supported you. All right, Council, we have two items left. Item, we're at item 13G, consider action to approve the first reading of Ordinance 2021-10 of the City Council of the City of Bastrop, Texas, amending the budget for fiscal year 2021 in accordance with the existing statutory requirements, appropriating the various amounts herein as attached in Exhibit A, repealing all prior ordinances and actions in conflict herewith, establishing an effective date, and move to include on the July 27, 2021 City Council consent agenda for a second reading, Ms. Waldron. All right, good evening. So just to reiterate our financial policy, it, it does require a budget amendment by council if it is uh, affecting a department. These are both separate funds, so it, it's kind of a little bit different tonight, but uh, we did have a few projects that have come up that required a budget amendment in order to move forward with these projects. The first budget amendment is increasing the expenditures in the designated fund we did have some of the expenditures for this special funds that we receive from waste connections that relate to public education activity and we have an opportunity to use these funds on main street to put out recycling and to have a promote and and have a recycling program and so we just needed to add some more funds to that in order to use available fund balance on that the second one is, um, and there's two parts, we're increasing revenue because we've received the sponsorship money, and then we're also increasing the expenditure in order to order the additional benches that I talked about in my staff um, memo. So those are the two amendments. Any questions? Thank you, Ms. Waldron. Any questions? Councilmember Rogers, since you are our liaison to the Main Street, I think it, I just want to confirm that the Main Street Committee is in agreement with these two projects. Actually, I'm confused on Amendment 1, but I thought they were going to be donated and we had a, pro a project. Would you like to know what? I mean, I've never heard of them being donated, but we actually have the funds for a recycling program. Rebecca, is my, my misunderstanding the wastewater or the donating? The funds for our recycling program come from the waste connection contract, a portion. So this isn't for the It's a donation yet. from waste connections for a recycling program. Now I understand. Yeah. So it's a donation coming in. Okay, now I understand. Yes, that's correct. They're donating the trash cans. Is that right? They're donating the funds and we're purchasing the trash can. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So these are the funds. Right. So this is just. So explain the program so that's what they're not understanding. Okay. We got, we got the wastewater to wastewater connections. Right. To, to give they, us the money. So they put, to, they, put, they put money aside for a recycling program. 
And so we are developing a downtown recycle programs for them to allow us to take those funds and purchase trash and recycling cans. For Main Street? Yes, ma'am. So do you guys understand? They're giving us the funds, we're coming up with the recycle program, and they're giving us the funds to, for us to buy the trash cans. Let me clarify. So as part of our contract, we get about approximately $10,000 from Waste Connections every year. So those funds have been- Okay, I'm totally confused, thank you. So those funds have been being set aside each year. And, um, and so this is an opportunity to use some of those funds. It's a, it's a, it's a perfect project for what they're stipulating those funds to be spent on. So they've given $10,000 a year and it's been, it's gone into a separate fund Designated and hasn't been, fund. been used? That's right. Okay. So we're developing a recycling program. Get your mic. We're developing a recycling program so we can take those funds and it falls under the usage of those funds to purchase the trash recycling cans. And that's something that's been happening for a while with them making the donation for the, pro the projects have just differed from year to year. Uh, we've right? never used the funds from my understanding. It, they've just been growing in that account. The, yeah, the staff report said we've been getting it and it's been stacking up. Right, so we're developing a program that falls under that fund category. So Waste Connections will allow us to use the funds for that. So, um, Mr. City Manager, I think Council would like to know, are there any other funds that we're getting that are just stacking up? Because we Right, wanna... because that's not the way it was under, that's not the way it was explained at the Main Street meeting. The Main Street meeting, my understanding, and I haven't missed any meetings, is that we were looking for trash cans, so we went to Waste Connections looking for a way for donations. No one said they were already donating. That's where my confusion came from. We're just going to use something that's already in a fund. My understanding was that we went and asked them for donations. So, apologies. So, w the board came up with the idea to ask our waste Sorry, provider. Yes, I, I sit on that board, yes. Right, to ask our waste provider if they would fund the trash cans. So, I went to Tracy to talk about that option. And Tracy said that there may be funds available. And she pulled all of the details on how we get access to those funds, what we're allowed to use those funds are. And so we developed the idea to do the downtown recycles program, which went back to the Main Street Board and said, okay, we may be able to use the waste connect, these waste connection funds to do this downtown recycles program. I get and it, I get it. I'm just saying that it, was my, it wasn't my understanding that the funds were already here. Okay, I, so I apologize that. was my confusion. I'm sorry, I couldn't explain it better, but no, no, that was not the way it was going to be explained at the meeting. I apologize for that. So I would like to know from Ms. Waldron, after this is funded, how much money is left in that fund? I have on here, there's approximately 52,000 available funds, so I think this project is spending 20, how much was the, about 20, Looks like 000. 20. Okay, so there'd be 32,000 left in that fund that has criteria around the ability to use it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just think that that could be beneficial for the Main Street Board. Council Member Jackson? I'm just a little confused too because over the years with, um, at least when I served on the Main Street Board, there was money that was dedicated for, it was dedicated toward recycling and I thought we did programs with the schools and other organizations and took some of the funding that's been a few years ago, though, yeah, so. We just haven't but, had a, a program in the last several okay. years. But we have had something similar to it in the past. I just wanted to, to make sure that we were aware of that. I mean, it's, the money had, was collected and it was specifically for recycling. And, uh, and it, we did programs with the schools and uh, other program, other organizations in the community, so. Okay. It, it was that, are you, are, I want to make sure that I wasn't cutting you off. Are you done? All right. So on the second project of the uh, benches, Council Member Rogers, does that make sense? Are you cool with that one? Is Main Street Board supportive of that one as well? It's money and the money they raised, yes. All right. Okay. Any other questions for Ms. Waldron? Move for approval. I have a motion to approve from Council Member Peterson. Second. A uh, second from Mayor Pro Tem Nelson. Is there any further discussion? Madam Secretary, if you'll call the roll. Council Member Peterson. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Nelson. Yes. Council Member Jackson. Yes. Council Member Crouch. Yes. 
Council Member Rogers. Yes, I would like to make a comment though. Absolutely. If we have funds for recycling, then why are the trash cans on Main Street already rusted out at the bottom if we had funds somewhere we could use? I don't understand that. If they were already sitting somewhere, that we all we had to do is come up with a recycling program, which all it is is an education program that we're gonna start, we could have used the funds. So the trash can shouldn't have already been rusted out on the bottom in the first place. That's my misunderstanding. Sorry. Thank you, Council Member Rogers. All right, Council, we're moving on to our next agenda item, which is 13H. Consider action to approve resolution number R-2021-69 of the City Council of the City of Bastrop, Texas, confirming appointments by the Mayor of Carol Kaiser to place four on the Fairview Cemetery Advisory Board as required in Section 3.08 of the City's Charter and establishing an effective date. Council, most of you know Ms. Kaiser. She's very active in the um, Historic Museum and, and with the Visitor Center, and uh, she is really interested in the history of the cemetery and I think that she would be a great fit for the board and I respectfully request your approval of her appointment. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, Councilmember Jackson. Well, I know that she's very actively involved you know, with the museum and with historical. Is, um, does this board not require someone to live in the city limits? They are allowed to live in the ETJ. In the ETJ. Yes, okay. sir. Move for approval. I have a motion to approve from Councilmember Peterson. Second. And a second from Councilmember Jackson. Is there any further discussion? Madam Secretary, if you'll call the roll. Councilmember Peterson. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Crouch. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Nelson. Yes. Councilmember Rogers. Yes. Thank you, Council. The motion passes unanimously. And we are now on item 14, Councilmember Peterson. Thank you, Mayor. It'd be my honor to make a motion to adjourn. And a second. I'll second. That. Second from Councilmember Crouch. It is 9:55, and we are adjourned. Please be careful going home. Thank you.